thanks. Thanks, guys, mountaineering. So I'm going to kind of uh, share some basics uh, and some of my experiences. Wise first uh, comes with the disclaimer clearly. In a scale of one to ten, mountaineering, I'm probably at two. Um, so please don't consider that I'm on the guy who will be climbing Everest in very soon. Uh, am I preparing or do I have skill set? Maybe in the future, uh, but at this point, I'm I'm pretty low on skill set. I'm still learning. Okay. Um, so why this is my biggest passion um, and why it keeps me going every day, I'll share some of my experiences as well. Um, in this picture, this was taken on Mount Baker. Um, this is me actually leading the second part of the team. So on our team, we have three to four people. Um, and since the slope is not much, um, we're, we're not on ropes as well, just for some information. Okay, let's get started. So agenda-wise, uh, I'm gonna talk a lot more on general knowledge. So uh, this is where I was debating, how much should I share about personal experience? But if I share my personal experience, not knowing what things are, it may be tough like uh, gear, uh, how do you survive, what are, what are dangers of things that I look for, other things. So we kind of made a mix of this, um, both as a GK and also probably more um, as well, uh, personal experiences so that you guys can see why I do this. Um, what is mountaineering? Very simple question. Everyone thinks mountaineering, I think uh, is more like a snow and other things, but a lot of things that teach me personally for mountaineering is your perseverance, uh, getting to the goals wise, it feeds your soul. It's a very spiritual nature. I mean, you're closer to the nature, you feel very spiritual, religious. Uh, it's a huge exercise too, endurance wise. A lot of times it makes you believe in the impossible. Sometimes you may not make it to the summit. It's okay. You try to come back again next time. That's the thing. And all above all of that, you trust your team. The people you go with because something happens to you, that's the team that's going to bring you back. Right? So those are the kinds of things that we're going to talk about a little bit. Uh, why mountaineering? And I'll show some examples of some of these things. How you, you can connect and how I connect myself to this. Um, just want to show the survey results when we took uh, this kind of a small paragraph we wrote. Uh, we climb mountains for, this is what all the survey team said, we climb mountains for nature and best views. Um, Vishnu, we have been exposed to 20k feet. Uh, some people have been to 20k feet, which is great, um, but mostly hey, stayed Vishnu. at 5k feet. Yes. Vishnu, I, I can only see your main mountaineering. Uh, have you switched the... The slide, what slide are you showing right now? I'm still showing with a box of uh, survey results. Can you see that, where my you mouse might, is? You might want to share this uh, other screen. Ah, okay, one second, one second. Thank you, guys. New share. Let's see. And this one, no, not this one, this one. Is that better? Is that better? Yeah. The, yeah. What is now? I have the what is mountaineering and survey. Okay. Yeah. This is right. Okay. Sorry about that. Uh, apologies. Okay. No problem. Man. Yeah. It's my <laughs> perseverance on slide decks that helps me get this. Okay. Out. Sounds good. So hopefully, <laughs> let me go to the picture again. Maybe that's better. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that was my first picture. So this was the second one. Okay. Just uh, high level. We'll talk about resources and books as well. And this, this is a climb we did Mount Baker uh, as well. Uh, this is the third slide that I was kind of going through. That's, I think, me trying to dig out snow for this. Um, and the survey results, uh, everyone says we climb mountains for nature and best views. And some of us are being exposed to 20K feet, but mostly stayed at 5,000 feet, which is kind of close to sea levels, that type of stuff. A um, lot of us has walked more than around 10 miles and carried over 20 pounds, which is a great, great metric for day hiking quite a bit. So a lot of our, our team is day hikers. Uh, time and lack of partners are the best hurdles I, I heard from the team here. We're gonna talk about those as well uh, during the session and how we can allocate, get, get some time, how I, I do to get some time uh, for these. Okay, so let's get into a simple topic. What is hiking versus trekking? What is mountaineering versus expedition? Hiking, of course, everyone knows it's a small trip. It's not huge elevation gain, easy to moderate. You go come back home by evening probably. At trekking, sometimes these are very, very long hikes. 
um, the change in nature, uh, the change in difficulty, uh, and sometimes the trailhead is not the same where you went. Uh, there is a, a trek or trail in Canada, Trans-Canada Trail, which is 13,000 miles. I mean, some people do that uh, in three, four years. Um, there is PCT, Pacific Crest Trail, which is around 300 days or 2,782 miles. Mm. So all these types of, these are called trekking side, where uh, you do backpacking, of course. And mountaineering is a little more on the higher side where you do have technical gear that's involved a little more. You get lots of training uh, specifically. And most of the time, you, of course, 2,500 is pretty small, but you will probably gain up 4,000 to 5,000 feet of gain um, roughly in a moment. Expedition is a little more different. Like a lot of times you see on these movies, great movies or anything. That's pretty much all the expedition stuff, um, which is like Mount Everest going to like significant movies and all these things falling into crevasses. Um, so that's once expeditions, I would say it's a long time it takes to get to the camp. They're not easily approachable. You have a lot many porters. Porters, you stay like 30, 40 days because you got to figure out the routes. Uh, weather conditions could be a little more severe because you are in high, very, very high altitudes. As well. um, I'll share about these pictures later. This is the same picture um, during probably summer, and this is in winter. Exactly. Um, uh, this is a frozen lake. The lake, so we camp right on the frozen lake. So, and this is the California guys. If they know, this is Mount Shasta. Uh, we're carrying so this pack. This is just a summit pack, which is around 28 pounds, I think, that day that we're carrying. Um, also, a lot of people uh, may not recognize mountaineering also includes rock climbing. Um, I won't go into much too much details. Of course, difficulty of scrambling. Most of these pictures are mine, except a few. Of course, this guy is not me. Um, this is not mine, but most of them are my pictures. So. Uh, scrabbling, of course, you just walk up and down, which is on the easier side uh, for class four um, to use. Uh, why class four? There is a way of classification. Um, and one is just you stand and walking is uh, class two is, of course, you need a little bit. Uh, once in a while, you use one hand. Class three is you use three, uh, three, uh, one leg, uh, two legs and one arm. Uh, clearly, class four is like all the time. You, this is a class four that I was doing here. A uh, tread climbing means the gear, you're placing a gear while you're climbing up. So nothing there on the stones, nothing there, you create gaps wise. Uh, sport climbing is there is always something already fixed. It's someone who is nice people uh, who have done climbs before, uh, public health um, volunteers, they create these anchors and they kind of do. So while you are going up, you kind of clip through, um, clip through and then. A uh, top roping, um, so someone climbs early, uh, they clip in like this, and then uh, once the rope is there, you start climbing up. So it's kind of used a lot more for uh, uh, practicing, learning, and other things. Bouldering is kind of climbing. It builds a lot of upper body strength. Uh, a little tougher. It looks uh, easily accessible in a lot of places. Uh, one thing that I want to clearly mention, this guy is named is Alex. Um, so he set the world, uh, I mean, he's the top pioneer for rock climbing. The reason why... This is probably 9,000, uh, I think it was 3,000 feet, sorry. 3,000 feet vertical drop. And he climbs this. Uh, it's uh, it's the, the wall, uh, they call it. They're not climbing the world's biggest wall in the world. Um, so everyone does this three days, roughly, first thing. And they do it with ropes. Um, this guy, first time he has done with no ropes, no equipment, and all the way through. That's the guts. guts. It's called free soloing. Um, so when you do not use anything, He's, uh, he's probably, you'll see any rock climbing pictures, you'll probably see him mostly. Have you done free solo? Uh, no, man, no. Uh, I, I have a little more dear to my life, so. <laughs> um, I, I manage my risk a little more better. Um, uh, and of course, these guys get paid to do this. I don't get paid to do this, so I do it for fun. <laughs> uh, but it is an acceleration. That's the adrenaline rush that you get is absolutely Kind of bouldering is a free soloing, but of course this is not this high. Like so, a lot of people they get their adrenaline rush through bouldering. So if you do bouldering like V zeros to V eights, and then there is significant levels of um, bouldering. Um, I actually suggest if you guys have kids which are around five, ten years old, 
I actually suggest your kids to put to rock climbing uh, as gyms around their area. The reason why it helps is it also builds the upper body strength. One thing where I didn't, I wasn't aware until I started going to rock climbing gyms as well. Upper body strength very well. It builds a lot of calmness in you. Uh, some kids are very, very excited, right? I mean, as if like they had sugar intake every minute. Uh, that type of behavior, um, the kids come in with so much energy. Once they start doing this rock climbing, they become so patient because they got to learn how to do it themselves. They got to figure out the plan. Okay, what is my next step going to look like? So that's a small advice. If you guys have kids, put them in there. I mean, there are lots of free classes, rock climbing gyms offer to kids on Sundays and Saturdays. Uh, that will help you guys. Uh, you as well. I mean, you can join the kids. Uh, kids can do much better than me because, yeah. Upper board. Um, this is also ice and mixer climbing. Um, so uh, that's me kind of trying. This is kind of an ice climbing, and you can see it's top rope already. Um, so what we do is we just use ice axes. Uh, we put in ice screws in to stop ourselves for next um, in case when well, you're going up. Mixed climbing includes like a rock and ice together. Uh, kind of same tools, but these picks will change roughly um, sometimes. And of course, these are crampons. I'll talk about crampons a little more in the later side. Uh, these are called ice screws. So these ice screws are kind of turned in into the ice and these, and you hang off from here. So if there, if there is a fall, this kind of are you and the top anchors are done with these ice screws as well. So question for metallurgists probably here. Um, so these ice screws are made with steel or aluminum as well, right? So what could be the reason why someone would can pick an aluminum versus a steel? Okay, this is gonna be an interactive session. I mean, I got more questions yeah. like that. So hopefully someone is can it, answer it. Is it rust? Um, no, aluminum is not rustable either. I mean, especially in the small time that you use. Um, um, first thing, of course, a lot of people like aluminum because it's lighter, right? Okay. But the disadvantage of aluminum is um, it conducts heat very fast. So where in the heat do we get from in the ice? I mean, you can see very our very nice friend called sun. If the sun falls on this face, this screw will come out. Uh, if it is an aluminum screw, it comes out within two, three minutes out of the ice. It, that's the reasons why we have to be very careful where the sun is and how you're climbing because the type of ice screws you put in as well. Um, so this becomes very loose because once the sun hits this part, it connects the heat inside and starts uh, like melting out the ice all around. So a lot of people actually, they, they use this uh, ice screws first once they reach a spot, we put all the ice screws inside so that to cool these off as well. So it's a very important, I mean, uh, to manage small details like this, uh, but it is scary in case if the screw comes up, you are falling off. And of course, we have multiple anchors, but still, that's something that you got to be careful of. So materials makes a difference as well. Um, these are shafts, aluminum shafts. Sometimes you have straight shanks, you have these curved shanks. Depends upon the ice terrain and other things you choose. Um, so you can see this guy has a straight shank, uh, whereas this one is a little more handled very nicely and ergonomic as well. Um, uh, Vishnu Premrad this side. Yeah, go ahead. Raj. Yeah, just tell me one thing. You just told me that uh, you know there are there are pros, right? And of mm -hmm. course there are amateurs, which means someone pays. Who pays and for what? Oh, uh, um, you're talking about these ones, the volunteers. Yes. Um, yes. So there are like a good-hearted volunteers. They wanted to do rock climbing regularly. So when they do rock climbing. Um, this costs, I mean, probably 15, 20 bucks, and you need a very good concrete drill, right? So some people's, the, their fun stuff is on weekends, some people just go and put these, uh, these ones in regularly. Um, there is, a, like in Pacific Northwest, there are three or four groups that does that. Um, and uh, if, if they ask for volunteers, and it also what happens is this group kind of, uh, also gives an option for the newcomers to come and loan along with them while they are putting the roots up, okay? So in that way, they create more volunteers as well as a pipeline. Yeah. Okay. Which is a great. A living doing this? But in ice crew, I mean, this ice climbing, there is nothing 
that you will put on. This is, I mean, you have to create your own um, every time. Uh, no, my question um, is, I'll, can you actually make a living doing this as in mountaineering? Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, you can. I mean, there is rock climbing gyms you can go to, uh, ice climbing uh, classes, you can courses you can teach. There are guides, uh, multiple guides. Like in Pacific Northwest, you probably can have like 50 guide uh, expedition uh, groups, actually. Uh, they get, uh, I don't know how much they get paid, but yeah, these are part of their living. I mean, uh, they are actually guides. And maybe they work on during weekdays and other things, but they take even people up uh, on ice climbing routes. They claim um, they take for mountaineering route. So one of the suggestions that I have for how to get into mountaineering is go with these guides initially to learn uh, quite a bit about mountaineering. They teach you a lot of uh, basics and their main purpose is safety. Uh, that's the first thing. It's not about climbing the summit. They want to teach you the safety. So. That's one way you can. Uh, yes, they do make uh, money livings of these um, as well. I'll talk about this, uh, what this right. hole is. It's, uh, a lot of people call this crevasse, but it's not. It's actually Moline. This is probably 700 feet deep, it could be as well. Um, the reason why I say that is this is where all the water comes in from anything that comes in starts uh, going in and it creates a big hole. So once you fall in here, there's no way to coming out. So that's why we try to kind of scare ourselves as well but we top rope and try to learn about it. So kind of learned about a little bit of climbing. So first thing I want, a uh, question that came up is like, okay, how do I survive, right? Any mountaineer or hiker or trekker, if you ask, there are 10 essentials. Even if I go for a hike uh, next door near my, near my house, uh, I take these 10 essentials. The reason why I take these 10 essentials is because it's a very crucial for you to survive in any minute, any moment how you can get out of the situations wise. So these, when people talk about 10 essentials, these are very key things. Um, and a lot of people say, oh, well, it's too much weight. I'm not going to take it. I know this is, but when something happens, you will clearly understand why. I'll, I'll share why some of these are very important. Um, so map, I think everyone knows map, right? But a lot of people don't know how to read a map. That's one of the key things. Topology maps are very, very important to understand. Um, I think I just put in a couple of pictures here and lots of maps you can get from these apps as well. So these are all the maps that I use uh, before I, I pick it out and to go on a mountain. Um, I use download these, uh, there is reports up there. I use USGS maps wise, but of course, every place in the world has different types of maps. Um, lots of details about maps. I mean, clearly you can, when you look at a map, you can tell this is a peak area. Um, this kind of like a ridge line, you can see what is the altitude that is 5,600 feet and how the altitude, if, if you see lines so close enough, that means it's a very steep area or a cliff, that's what they call it, okay? Um, and there is also a saddle because so sort of like flat area where you can, there is a good place for us to camp here. Um, so this is like where there is, the, there is nothing much is listed here, it's kind of like a dry area. Um, and uh, some things like dense vegetation. There is lots of ways you can read the map. Just by itself, there is classes and trainings wise. When we look at some of the maps, like just the all trails wise. So this is a highway very close to my house. So from here I start and I know which trail I can go. And these are all the mountains that I can try. Not mountains, I mean at least peaks, uh, some few peaks and so. Um, there is an REI that teaches you of class how to read a map. This is something very important for kids to learn. If your kids are in Boy Scouts or something, this is something they will teach you. We'll talk about this later in the next slide. But um, so this is how a map looks. This is very important. Map is the only way that you can come back home. The reason when you have a whiteout, you don't see anything. Uh, map is the only way that you can figure out how to get back to the spot that you wanted to. Um, we'll talk about compass. Um, I think everyone's seen a compass as nothing but just a neuro um, till now, or in their cell phone and an app, and this goes into the utilities app or somewhere. But this is the most important thing when nothing works. Uh, when you have minus 10, minus 15 degrees, there is no way you will be able to use a cell phone and see where you want to have, first of all, a connection. The GPS may or may not work, first thing. And the second thing is you won't be able to open the phone because it's, it's very cold. Your fingers cannot be able to activate the phone properly. 
Um, so all these conditions you'll, you will probably get into. The only way you will be able to get a bearing, how to get from one spot to the other spot, uh, what is the angle that is required. And it kind of shows how, how you can use the compass. If someone is really interested, I can have a session on it. It's just very important for us to know how to use this compass uh, in a survival life because mountains, you would get the clouds, you will get the whiteout, we call it, and you cannot see five feet in front of it. That's the time when you see a compass, if you know a bearing that it is like uh, 54 degrees uh, to the east, then I can set it up and then I can clearly go for, for that direction and I will hit on the spot exactly. One thing that you got to be very clear about is even whether you use campus or not, even a single degree off, right? Um, if you travel a mile, you're 100 feet off from your destination. So you can imagine how much uh, accuracy you need to have uh, while traveling some of these places twice. Um, um, question, what is a magnetic north? I think a lot of people know probably, but uh, just a question for the team. Yeah, do we know there is two types of knots, at least uh, hypothetically, theoretically? One is, of course, the true north, which is where uh, where we consider as north pole, right? According to our maps and everything. When you use a magnetic compass, magnetic north is is yeah. probably in alignment with the geo, uh, the Earth's magnetic strength, right? That's correct. That's correct. So it changes every year, unfortunately. Uh, <laughs> Um, the reason why um, that is very important is a true north in my, specifically where I live near Seattle area, I am off 16 degrees from true north, magnetic north. So if I'm 16 degrees off, I'm, I'm actually more than a mile off already when I travel a mile, right? So that's the concerns that we have to look into. Magnetic north is something that is always listed in the maps. See, this is a magnetic north listed. So you got to look for these magnetic knots and adjust your compass wherever your location. So center of US, like Colorado, it is pretty much a zero, I would say. Um, and on the East Coast, it's actually, so yeah. Um, so here, six degrees, and then it's actually towards the East side. This is towards the West side, correction wise. Okay. So learn how to use the compass. That's very another one. This is the second essential. The third one, always carry something there where you can talk to someone or find someone, or let someone find you, something happens, right? I use this Garmin, which is, uh, I think you have a subscription every month, you gotta pay. Uh, yes, it is expensive, but um, at least I can text someone, I can call SOS with this button, um, at, as long as I have a visibility to the sky. That's the other issue. If I fell in a crevasse deep down, I wouldn't have a visibility to the sky. Pretty much I, this is useless as well. So. Uh, and avalanche, you use an avalanche gear, which is a radio frequency one, and then you use probes to find someone as well. Most of these gears is not meant for you. It's actually meant to save your friend. Uh, because when you fall in avalanche, you won't be using it. Your friend will be using this to save you. So walkie talkies, of course, uh, uh, communication. Altimeter, this one helps. A lot of people use this. Um, I'm not a big fan of a watch. So I generally, from a map, I know exactly what my altitude is. Uh, but if some people use this, say, hey, I'm 9,500 feet. So on my map, I know I'm roughly around this area. So based upon that, I think I should be right here based upon that height. So people can use this to kind of figure out where they are on the map as well. This is the third one that I would say as a 10 essentials. Fourth one, very simple ones, headlamp. Um, the reason why headlamp is very important is you never know what happens when you will return back, right? You may be forced to stay overnight somewhere because there was no access, something happened, or there is a bear sitting right in the pathway that you cannot get around, right? Um, so headlamp is very important because you need to see the light. Um, or anything that happens, night is completely different versus dark. Um, so there's multiple types of headlamps. I mean, uh, um, the beam focus changes, red red light, uh, red, we use a lot of times red um, as well along with the white, which I'm using here. The reason why I use white is to take a picture. The red kind of helps you from an eye perspective. You don't dilate the pupils uh, very much. Whereas the, when you use white light, it dilates the pupils very much because so much reflection on the snow wise. 
Uh, people say like, how can you walk in dark with the headlamp just alone? No, headlamp actually gives you pretty nice light. I mean, these headlamps are very powerful. Um, just always remember, headlamps does not work in very cold temperatures like your lithium ions and other things. Don't trust those. Always get nickel, cadmium, uh, cadmium normal batteries ones um, as well. Um, so there is a reason why I always carry a second headlamp because that's uh, your only source of light to come down as well. Uh, the fourth essential I will talk about is sun protection. Um, sunglasses, of course, multiple ways of sunglasses, I mean, anti fog, mirror finish, side, side shields is very important, uh, clearly, because this is where sometimes you get the rays from. Um, and sometimes you use these goggles as well in case I use, um, I can't see without specs sometimes. Um, so I use these over my spectacles uh, if the glare is too much. Um, or if uh, the terrain is bad, I use this rather than this one. Um, nose protectors is optional. Everyone uh, looks at this like, what a goofy guy he looks like. I don't care. I mean, for me, that protects my nose. Uh, I don't have to put, I mean, the way I'm protecting myself, the only place I have to put sun lotion is just around my this area. Nothing much. I'm protected everywhere from the sun. Within 30 minutes, you can burn your screen on a snow, very bright snow sometimes. Um, so it all, especially in the high altitudes, uh, high latitudes that we are in, especially the Seattle area, that type of Canada, that side, uh, your sun protection needs to be more and more. Uh, question, what is SPF 50? Sunscreen. Good, okay, that's a very good start. Sun protection factor, they call it, okay. so. Why 50? And I think you have seen SPF 30, SPF 15 as well, right? Reduces by 50%. That That's correct. Okay, 50%, it blocks 50% of the UV rays. So there is a 2% of UV rays that, two or 3%, it depends upon the location, 3%. Um, so it blocks 98% of the UV rays and only allows only 2% of the rays to come through, right? So that's that's what uh, fifty percent means. Um, if it is a SPF thirty, means it's a box three percent. That allows three percent of the SPF, uh, ultraviolet rays, UV rays. A lot of these make sure that uh, it blocks uh, A, uh, UVA, and B. A lot of people ignore uh, some cheap uh, SPFs or cheap sunglasses. You get they block only one certain type of UV. They call it proof. But uh, don't fall for those. Uh, please always get how, UVA and B sun protection. How did, how did you get from 50 to 2%? Um, there is only a 4% uh, of uh, UV in the total light. Okay. 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 So SPF 50 means like they allow 98% uh, uh, they block everything, right? The sun. Um, this, uh, and then they only 2% is what they allow this. Got it. Um, if someone says SPF 60, I mean, that's probably bogus numbers. I mean, there is very not easy way to block like 99.99%. So uh, the way you apply it itself will get rid of all that error. So sun protection is very, very important. Um, you can burn the skin and that will also start causing problems a lot more faster and uh, you know, very unpleasant, uh, literally. Um, so the 10 essentials, first aid, I think everyone knows about first aid. It's not about carrying a first aid. You should know how to use it. A lot of times I've seen many of my friends like, oh yeah, yeah. And I'm not saying you don't have to carry this elaborate, heavy uh, doctor's first aid. I mean, make sure you know what's in the first aid. I mean, pain meds, I mean, gloves sometimes, uh, uh, and kind of how to use them. Uh, it's very simple, YouTube, so many YouTubes are there. And there is also wilderness medicine class. I mean, how to use, uh, how to survive uh, if something injury happens, uh, how to dress yourself up and other things. There are some classes as well. I put in a link here um, in case if this presentation goes out to the others. A knife, which is very important. I mean, for all, lots of reasons, right? You can even cut duct tapes and other things. Shelter, emergency bivy. So this is just a small packet that I use uh, specifically. The reason why this is, it's nothing but an aluminum, kind of an aluminum foil. Uh, when you stop hiking and you sit down for less than 30 minutes, if, even if it is normal weather, right, you will get into the colder, colder side. So you want to protect your body heat. That's why when you see all these rescue operations and everyone, the first thing they do is they cover a person with this one is 
because they want to protect the heat that's within the body. Uh, they don't want to get into the lower temperatures. Wise. So always carry this. This is like two ounce or three ounce max I mean, uh, from a weight perspective, but it can save your life. Um, the other 10 essentials, we'll talk about these more in detail because this is very, these are very critical. Um, uh, of course, uh, fire, stow, or something like that, nutrition, hydration, installations, and some other few things. These are not 10 essentials, but at least every time I always carry some form. Toilet paper, of course, when you want to go to the bathrooms and other things, um, and duct tape. Um, everything can be fixed by duct tape, I'll tell you that. <laughs> Uh, you may not like the way it fixes it, but it will fix everything. It will fix I mean, your broken poles. It will fix your broken tents. I mean, anything. Hand warmers is something that they do carry in case if you really get too cold for some other reasons. And uh, rope, small rope to tie some certain things. Like something broken down, you want to uh, kind of tie yourself up to or anything. Just, uh, uh, yeah, you, you carry those. So I'll talk about these ones later. So those are the 10 essential. How you can, if you have these 10 essentials, you can clearly survive uh, very well in lots of these conditions. Um, I'll talk about the clothing and other stuff, which is the most important thing in survival wise. A human can survive without food for more than probably 15 days even. Uh, of course, not with no normal or less exercise. But without the water, I think he can survive only a, a day and a half. Um, so that's, so food is not the issue. Uh, during survival times. How can you communicate to someone? How can you keep yourself warm? Okay, how can you keep yourself away from danger? Or is there a way you can get back home some form with your tools that you have? That's why these 10 essentials are key. Every mountaineer will carry these 10 essentials all the time, should be carrying at least. Okay, let's get into the details of tents wise. I think you have seen beautiful colorful tents and the flopping in the winds and other things, right? So uh, basically the two types of tents are probably, I would say three types, two season one as well, but three season versus four season. So uh, three season, a lot of mesh inside and the three season will come with the rain fly on the top, uh, which prevents from rain or cold or anything that comes in. The four season is mostly a single wall tents like this. Um, very sturdy, um, no rain flies, nothing, but uh, there is no mesh or anything like that, okay? Or if it is, there will be very little amount of mesh, like just for, uh, okay. um, the biggest things that these uh, tents face is the, you're called uh, ventilation, uh, condensation inside. Since you're breathing, you're breathing probably half a liter in four hours of, in, your, in, in your breath itself. That all condenses because everything outside is cold and freezing. So everything condenses inside. So the water that you breathe out will actually be falling on you. That is one of the biggest concerns of a tent wise. So you gotta be very careful and see how you manage your tent, where you put the tent, how far you put the tent from the waters. Uh, um, the tent composed of uh, uh, pretty much uh, like the frames. Of course, the frames make it sturdy. Uh, the more expedition style you get, the more sturdier the frames are. Um, generally, the X X uh, one is a little more sturdier um, than normally. Sometimes they just do this normal. The stakes, there are multiple types of stakes you put in. One, um, these type of stakes is just for dirt. These types of stakes are used for snow. Um, some they use it. And we also put in called a dead man anchor here. Uh, that means anything happens, this will never come out on the tent stays there, like kind of a heavy wind comes through or anything like that. Uh, big thing, the whole reason why you put a tent is, you know, to keep you away. Always practice putting tent at home. Because uh, sometimes you would be forced to put a tent in 50 miles per hour wind in 10 minutes, in less than 10 minutes. If you want to put this tent in 10 minutes, that means you should know exactly how you should have prepared this tent wise. Yes, that is one of the most important things. Mountaineering, once you reach up, up there, you want to put the tent as the first thing. You gotta be very fast. Um, you gotta be very efficient because you want to get away from the cold wind. You want to get inside um, and then keep your cold body temperature. Okay. Wind is one of the biggest uh, killer of mountains. Um, so why I talk about it, I think this is a chart that kind of explains a little bit the higher temperatures, I mean, temperatures and the speeds wise, right? Um, frostbites, you can get frostbite within 30 minutes. Uh, it's just normal 40 degree temperatures and 
and probably five degrees of uh, winds wise. Um, and that's the reasons why we are protecting ourselves. It is important staying away from the wind in an emergency shelters or some form. Create yourself in long hair. So if you don't have a tent, you gotta get within 30, 45 minutes, you gotta be in a shelter sub form if you are in order to survive well. Um, some of the emergency shelters, like you can just dig small holes, stay away from wind, put some tarp on or anything that comes on, you can put some backpacks on to stay away, or you can dig like big holes through, or you can dig caves as well. You get some of these trained when you go for mountaineering classes. And you can build walls like this. I mean, of course, this is in uh, Antarctica where people build like blocks wise, uh, they use saws and belt it. But you can just create a wall with the snow itself. I mean, some, but it does take work. Uh, but at the end of the day, if you are away from the wind, the amount of work that you put in in order to build this is much effective than uh, staying in the wind and surviving. Stay away from the wind. Uh, that's the most important thing. Wind, wind uh, 30, 40 miles of wind can take me, myself, my like uh, heavy weight or light weight um, off the cliff itself. Um, we we'll talk about food. Uh, I'm going to go through this faster because I mean, this is general GK, right? So once we get into the bigger ones, I'll kind of slow down. So if you have any questions, please uh, right away ask. Um, hot and warm foods are the most important things for mountaineering. Um, the more heat that you can put inside your body, the more uh, better you feel, the organs will perform better. Uh, you'll have more energy otherwise. The biggest thing for the stouts are wind is an issue and altitude. Altitude kills timing wise. We do calculate fuel. Uh, we take time to calculate how much fuel we got to carry. Uh, the thing is, the more fuel you carry, the more weight you have to carry. Uh, the less fuel you carry, you will not be able to survive without much food, right? I mean, or you could be starving sometimes. So there are multiple types of stoves. You can use this type of stove. This type of stove is called, uh, it uh, blocks the wind-wise. We use this stove for any type of gasoline, liquid type of things as well. These are called canisters, uh, pressurized. Um, so this is pressurized canisters. A lot of hikers use this. Mountaineers get into this one. Um, and then um, kind of a medium between these two is this one. Um, so, but this is universal. You can go to anywhere, any country in the world. You, you, sometimes you don't get these and so on. And you can transport these in an airplane, these canisters. This ones, these are empty. Empty, you can transport these in the canisters. Wise. So first thing, pressure in this field. Once you go in the high altitude and colder temperature, this pressure drops by half. So your stove will not work exactly as the sea level. So always remember that, okay? So that's why these canisters are not easy to work in the mountaineering side. Um, if you're boiling water from snow, it takes a long time. It's not like boiling water at home either. Wind can double your cooking speed. Elevation, what, uh, how? So for example, I have a question here, I mean, uh, uh, if you just go from sea level to 10,000 feet, uh, what do you guys expect? I mean, it takes uh, how many times more um, from a seconds perspective it takes or minutes perspective it takes to boil food versus a sea level at 10K feet? One time, two times, three times, five times, 10 times? Three times. Three times, that's a good answer. Three to four is roughly, depends. And imagine if there is a severe wind, so that doubles six times. And if you're boiling from snow, that's 12 times. So you got to carry 12 times more fuel than you will burn during at, at sea level on a mountaineering. Now you can understand why this is so important, these factors, in order to carry how much fuel you need. Uh, and you're, you're doing three meals uh, sometimes in the mountaineering, or two meals, two big meals. So that means you're eating a lot the morning and afterward. Uh, the way I try to protect my wind is I use uh, like a screen aluminum foil. A lot of people do the similar. I also dig a small ditch so that it blocks away from the wind as well. Um, so fuel is very, very important because this is your only source of hot, hot food for you and temperature wise in your body. Hey, Vishnu, um, nutrition. Uh, hey Vishnu, quick question uh, on the previous one, man. Uh, sure. Why why do you have to cook? Like, I mean, why not just um, rely on protein bars or uh, prepared meals? You can, um, but the amount of, uh, your body needs heat when your body is exposed to so much cold, right? So for example, I mean, uh, in Mangalore, right? I mean, in Suratkal, uh, 
we always went for chai, right? Chai or a budgie or something in the gig when, when it is raining outside. Uh, the only reason is because our body always feels like it rejuvenates itself when there is some external source of heat that comes into your body. Yeah, this is what I'm talking about cold weathers. I mean, if I'm not talking about uh, hiking in Africa or in India, uh, that's a different story, right? Uh, when you're in mountaineering, you always want to get as much heat inside of your body. Um, I'll also talk about, share why that heat is very important because um, if you lose core body temperature, um, you will get into hypothermia very quickly. Um, that's why protecting your heat, uh, the fast way to get heat is through the food. Protein bars, it takes time for the body to create and also it needs energy to create that heat again. Whereas if you do this, uh, you are creating an automatic heat in the body. The second thing, um, why, why people don't eat snow even though they're dehydrating is because it takes more energy from the body to warm it up in your stomach, eat the snow and then convert it to water and then actually dilute your blood. Uh, so it's actually negative. Uh, yes, you can, you, 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 you will eat certain point, but you can't rely only on just eating snow. Uh, that's why uh, hydration becomes a big issue as well. Hopefully I answered you, Abhishek, on that. Yes, absolutely, man. Thank you. Hey, Vishnu. Yeah. Do you really cook the food or uh, heat the food? Um, uh, depends upon your taste. I prefer uh, actually boiling hot water. Okay, the more, and then uh, we, we uh, the first thing I'm going to talk about nutrition is everything is dehydrated food, I take, because uh, non-dehydrated non food is very heavy, okay? Mm -hmm. um, dehydrated food weighs half the, half the weight, um, anything. So you get lots of luxurious dehydrated foods. Um, of, and uh, I prefer to boil the water because I boil the water to uh, eat this and also make some tea as well. Um, I put it in a flask. I'll, I'll talk about that why. I'll also use it as a heat source for me during the night. Um, so boiling the water reaches a higher temperature. It takes more fuel. But if you are really, really hungry, I'll get some warm enough water, pour it into this, and then that's good enough. But if you have some time, I will let the water to get to the boiling point so that you can leverage that heat that generated into your body quicker. Always take the food that you like. And the reason is above at certain altitudes, you would not like to eat at all. Your appetite gets killed. You, you probably sometimes even because of altitude sickness, you throw up too. You don't want to eat. And that's the worst case scenario that you will end up with. So always try to take the food that you like. I mean, even in Indian food, right? I mean, I, I have found these things like poha is available. Um, Maggi, the perfect uh, meal for the night. You got lots of sodiums that's required for you. Uh, and sometimes in a flask, I carry like hot water with me. Um, and then I put in uh, this a small, like a soup based uh, mixture, like vegetable bouillons. Uh, depends upon what type of bouillon you like. You can just put it in and it turns it into like a vegetable soup. Um, um, and then you got lots of these stuffs. I eat lots of prune, uh, sorry, uh, dates, which gives us very sweetness and lots of other minerals in it. And of course, Nuts, which is a normal uh, hiking and other things. Always take the food that you like. I mean, because I know you're going there for a day or two. Yeah, just uh, eat something that you can um, keep the energy on. You don't want to try something there, right? I mean, um, I tried a couple of things and I hated it and I couldn't. Um, it's very tough for me to generate the energy. Uh, the other thing is people always forget about called the sodium. We uh, burn 500 milligrams of sodium is lost from our body when we sweat and during heavy hiking. Um, in a day, I think we need around 3,000 um, roughly. So one sixth for one hour of hike, you will lose it. So sodium is one of the key things that keeps regulates your body while hiking. Um, so make sure your nuts or any food that you're eating or electrolytes into your water supplies that sodium. If you don't have enough sodium, um, the circulation of our bloods kind of is not great, first thing, and then you will start developing cramps, muscle cramps very quickly. Uh, in extreme conditions, heart concerns as well. Um, you will see these uh, as an immediate effect. Uh, if, you're, if you're a person who sweats a lot, 
always try to make sure that there is some other form of sodium that comes in. That's why Maggie is absolutely filled with sodium. I mean, this is one place we actually uh, push you to eat more sodium in, in mountaineering, um, uh, which is good for your body um, and snacks and other things. So um, any questions on the food wise? And I think, you know, we born around 3000 calories per uh, probably for four miles, a small hike like this in mountaineering. This is a great, it's very fast, you can burn it, and it all depends upon weight and other things as well. So energy, food is important, and sodium is important, and make sure you keep dehydrated, right, for multiple, stick with dehydrated food with for multiple trips. Questions, guys? Anything on this? And these will stay up to, uh, one of these packets that I have, this will stay up to 2035. That's how long the shelf life of these food is, because they are dehydrated. Yeah. I, I prefer to use it in a year, but I mean, that's how much long they can survive. So a lot of survival uh, mode uh, packets, some things that you see online, some TVs, uh, people when they survive, try to survive a pack for years. This is the type of food they try to uh, store in their, in their garages and other things. Hydration, one of the most yeah, important things. One quick. One sure. quick comment, not a question, but in gen general, even while fasting or doing intermittent fasting, they say that the salts are important. I never knew why they say that, but in extreme conditions, I think the sweating may be one of the key reasons, right? But e even while fasting, I think you your body um, will, will ask for more salt. Mm -hmm. If salt regulates your... Uh... I think uh, I'm not a chemist. This is how, like the positive and negative ions, oh, chemical base are here. So um, that regulates your blood flow. Um, that changes the, the way the density of the blood changes because of that. Um, it also changes how much blood gets to the extremities of your bodies, uh, especially muscle needs, uh, the working muscles, especially the legs. That's where you struggle quite a bit if the salt is less in your body. It's not majorly sodium is one, uh, but you also have issues with potassium and a couple of other minerals as well. But sodium is one of the things. If you eat, kind of get some soft sodium, you get the other ones because that's how nature's uh, salt is. Uh, good, good comment, uh, Mesh. Hey, Vishnu. Yep. In a previous slide, uh, you showed a picture of open pan uh, trying to boil water. Yep. Is, is this is this a recommended practice or you should have something no, like a closed uh, vessel or pressure cooker? Yeah, always keep a lid, man. I'm sorry, yeah, uh, I took a picture. Good, good observation. Yeah, chemical laser are good. So, yeah, um, so they keep a lid on this. Yeah, in order to keep the build the pressure faster. If you cook this, it will take at least uh, 20, 30 percent more time. Yeah, this is not at all recommended, especially when you're boiling. Uh, but if you're boiling Maggie inside and keep a lid, this will overflow. So just be careful on that one. Okay, I've done that a couple of times. So, um, yeah. So we'll talk about hydration multiple ways. This is the flask I carry, the lighter weight. This is water is one of the heaviest items that you carry because you need roughly around three liters of water, roughly, and there is no other source for you when you're climbing on the high altitudes. Okay. You have snow, but that means you got to take 20 minutes off your schedule in order to melt the snow. So that means you carry more water. The more water you carry, the more weight you're carrying. So two and a half pounds, one liter of bottle. This one carries with water is filled two and a half pounds to 2.7 pounds. So just be cautious. Uh, you don't want to take like 10 liters of water because you will you will wear yourself out. Um, at least carry, always calculate the amount of water that you need. Um, Flask is very important, I mean, because this water can freeze uh, based upon that. There are different types of hydration. This is not recommended for mountaineering, but normal hikes, you can use this, very convenient. You don't have to take your bag off. You don't have to take your bottle off to drink it. This is the flask. This weighs probably, I think, nine ounce um, I have. And this is a close to a liter. This is where you put in any hot soup while you're going up, or even coffee or tea uh, that you made in the morning. You can take it along with you for the these are all filters. Water is not clean, right? Any lake you see or anything. So we use some of these filters. This is the one that I use very quick. You connect it to the top of the water bottle. You squeeze through the packet. Uh, the water comes out here and I fill this and then I boil it. If I'm really boiling to the 
100 degrees uh, C, then I don't filter it um, unless it's really infested with some things. Um, this is another type of filter, but a lot of people also use UV, uh, UV pens. They kill the bacteria, it seems, but I'm, I'm not sure if it is, but okay, there are different ways of doing it. Always try to get clean water. Um, in snow, when you're pulling snow to melt water, do not pick pink snow or yellow snow. Uh, pink is fungi in the snow. Lots of snows when you're, uh, when you're traveling, you'll see those pink colored snows. Uh, that is fungus that is uh, actually grows on snow as well. Yellow snow is of course, someone peed in there. So don't go there as well. Um, those are the two colors avoid in snow. Any other snow is absolutely fine. Uh, carrier flask. So any questions on this? Um, Oh, Nalgene bottle, this is one of the biggest innovation chemical guys have done, which is BOP free, BOF free. You can put hot boiling liquid inside this and it will stay in shape and it will be a great source of uh, heat for me. I take this and put it inside, um, inside my sleeping bag uh, before I go tonight, fill this with hot water. That is what gives me the warmth uh, for the rest. If my body is warm, I can do lots of things. If my body is cold, it, it kills you, the energy, everything drops significantly. So heat is one of the most important things. We, we create this radiant heater inside our body, uh, inside my sleeping bag by putting hot water. That's the biggest source of heat for the night for me. Um, um, question, so the water, I mean, once you start going up in zero degrees, water will freeze, right? I mean, how do you prevent from water from freezing? Even if it freezes, how do you, um, like this bottle, if it freezes, you're carrying one liter of dead brick for no use and water won't unthaw for nearly days, right? So that's one of the biggest issues. You got to stop water from freezing. If it freezes, you can't use the bottle and you can't throw the bottle because that's against nature, right? Uh, we don't want to throw anything that you take and you always back out everything. So how do you freeze this, stop letting this stop or cause not cause major issues for you, this bottle? hanging outside in the air, in the cold weather. So how do you keep this freezing? Just uh, any comments? Put salt in it. Sorry? Put salt in the water. Salt in water, that could be, yes. Electrolytes will help uh, first. Um, so when you see a lake, when it freezes, what happens, right? The freezing is happening only at the top. The water is good at the bottom, right? So what a lot of people, when they go for mountaineering, if you have to weigh is, they actually keep the bottle inverted. So the ice will be forming here because if it's inverted, and then you still have fresh water on this side. And the ice started forming here, clean sun. So in that way, at least even though you have ice, you still have water. If you keep this way and if it freezes up here, you don't get any water and you're just carrying dead brick after that. Right, so that's one way people avoid freezing a little bit. It's not avoid freezing, or at least ma manage the freezing wise. Second thing is you keep this uh, bottle in a place in your sleep uh, in your backpack that is closer to your back, uh, where the backpack is touching your back, because that's where there's a lot of heat and sweat and everything is on. So that also keeps this warm. That's why this hydration sometimes works. Sometimes they don't work in the Um those are a few ways and uh, you can. And then uh, what you do is you also take some of this hot water that you carried with you in mountaineering, put some in so that you keep regulating the temperature as well. So in that way, um, you have warm enough liquids as well. So keeping the water from freezing, what you have is very important. Once this freezes, like you can't do much. I mean, um, so that's one of the biggest struggles sometimes you gotta deal with. Uh, let's talk about clothes. This is the actually the most expensive stuff. And this is the most protection layer. The first defense of survival is this. Um, there are layers. Um, I think a lot of people know what layers means. I mean, you wear multiple layers with you and you take off and put on, depends upon the condition. First thing, no cotton. Cotton is against exactly in mountaineering. No one uses cotton in mountaineering. There were days people were using it, but of course now things have changed significantly. The reason, any reasons why cotton is not good at all in mountaineering? Get soggy and wet. Yep, wet is very good. Okay, when it gets wet, 
when you have zero degrees outside, it forms ice. Your sweat becomes icicles. You are scraping with ice on your backs. That's the first one. And anything that becomes that cold with ice, you cannot thaw it back very quickly. Um, so pretty much those clothes becomes useless. Um, so in the olden days, what they used to do is when they were carrying hot and act before canvas even, canvas uh, stuff, is they have to take multiple layers, multiple types of clothes. Now the technology has improved significantly. Um, so this is all wool stuff called merino wool, uh, they call it. Um, they have very good wicking capabilities, dry capabilities, dry fits. I think we have seen some of those as clothing underwear. They are made. This is called the first layer, uh, which is very hugging to the body, takes away the sweat, everything, uh, and keeps you warm as well. Sometimes this is good enough uh, based upon. And of course, this is sometimes people wear it as leggings, depends upon how cold the weather is or the wind is and those things. Uh, this is a must. Clearly, do not wear a cotton or haze underwears. Uh, spend money to get expensive underwears. This is because this is the place where you sweat a lot and you actually need to uh, keep it dry. Uh, the second layer comes in is uh, the protection layer. Um, it's uh, called mid layer. And you can also use an optional, another third layer roughly, which is a lightweight jacket on top to protect the winds. But from a pants perspective on top of this, this is a kind of a second layer or slash third layer. Uh, the fourth layer, uh, third layer, is actually a puffy jacket, which is made with the doubt feathers, the synthetic feathers now, very warm um, and keeps everything. Um, and the final one is this uh, uh, rain and wind protector, hard shell or soft shell sometimes. Um, these are heavy, these are heavy, and uh, these ones are light. Um, so it depends upon your expeditions or mountaineerings, you change the uh, fill rate of a Dell, like eight, 850 fill rate or 600 fill rate Dell. This is hard shell and soft shells as well. These clothes are very expensive. Um, I'll just give an, uh, um, an idea what these clothes, especially this one, uh, Arctex um, hard shell uh, coat. This is closely around 850 bucks, just this jacket. It is nothing but a very thin layer um, that protects you from wind, but this is your lifesaver. Um, so people uh, are okay to spend that uh, you know, in these types of conditions. So clothes are very expensive. And sometimes what we do is we take multiple layers of base layers. These ones we are not much, we take only one layer. These ones we take another extra layer if it is a two day trip or three day trip. Uh, gloves is the other one. You can wear liners, you can wear mid-weight gloves. Uh, heavy weights, and also there is called mittens. The reason why mittens are important, good is uh, when fingers are closer together in a mitten, you the heat is transferred from one finger to the other. If you use a glove like this, each finger is protected by itself. Um, um, so there is no heat transfer from one finger to the other. You lose a lot of heat through this versus a mitten. Um, so some people use mittens for long expeditions. Uh, but the problem with mitten is it's it's not easy for flexibility wise um, or you can using your fingers well. So kind of this, so this is a kind of a clothes wise, always manage your sweat. Um, if you don't start with like putting on 10 layers before you go to start your hiking, because you will get very hard. Once you, your body starts sweating in, that sweat is the worst enemy for mountaineering. So you gotta manage your head. Uh, sweat and heat as well. So that's why this layering system is there. It's okay to stop it. 10 minutes after you hike, take off the layers, uh, but make sure you don't sweat significantly inside. Uh, that will create a very thermal uh, issues for you. Any questions on this one? Okay, so um, I'm gonna speed up because I think these are all general knowledge. So sleeping, a lot of people ask me, how do you sleep on snow? I mean, that's actually sleeping on snow is much better than sleeping on a land. The reason is it is softer. You can, it, it forms and contours to the shape you are, but you got to protect yourself from the cold, right? The way they do that is there is a two layers protection system. This is a dimple pad you put in here. Uh, of course, the tent is also rainproof. This is a picture of mine, um, which is a dimple pad is R2. So it's similar like your home ratings, right? Insulation rating. R2, and then you put on an air mattress on top, which is like a perforate, what do you call, 
chambered air mattresses that regulates heat and keeps the heat up and cold at the bottom. Um, and then come, kind of get into R6 level is where you always go. For it. Once you have an R6, you have a sleeping bag and you got enough clothes on you and you're sleeping, perfect. I actually sweat inside. So I, I sometimes have to sleep with only one base layer. I don't, uh, or even just a normal uh, thermal wear underwear um, because that gets so hot. And it also depends upon the type of sleeping bag you carry. There are sleeping bags up to minus 20 F and which of course the lower rating you go, the high heavier weight, that means you got to carry more. So these are different types of sleeping bags you got to carry. I, I have pretty much most of these. Um, my, I rarely use this, uh, but I use this one very regularly. Uh, and these ones and summer hikes when I go depends upon the temperature and wind. I, I use this. this is also a survival for you in case. But the problem with these sleeping bags is if it gets wet, yeah, the sleeping bag won't work for what it's meant for. So the condensation I talked about is inside the tent, managing that condensation. Uh, actually, you open up the door when you sleep, uh, as long as there is no wind coming from this side. The reason is you don't want that your breath and condensation happening inside your tent. So a lot of mountaineers, if you see, they, they have a small opening in the top or some form they open it uh, that's away from the wind in order to prevent the condensation. Okay, so I'm going to speed this up as well. The footwear, uh, multiple footwear. So approach shoes. Uh, this is kind of how to get to close enough to where you get into the mountaineering boots. Okay, some of these are expedition boots. Um, these are double boots, actually. There are two boots inside, um, integrated gaiters, I call it. Um, so these are all waterproof. Um, Waterproof is done by Gore-Tex, GTX uh, uh, layer they put on such that is water, water resistance wise. Uh, and these are all, I mean, good shoes. Uh, don't use this shoe to walk to the uh, to the base camp or something because this is a very stiff boot. You will start getting blisters and other things. So that's why a lot of people use this type of shoes. Even sometimes tennis shoes are okay, but as long as tennis shoes have a good grip, uh, these shoes are called approach shoes. You'll see those. Uh, um, expedition boots are very expensive. Uh, this probably will be around three to four grand. Uh, this is around 800 to 900, which is common for most of the uh, like mountaineering side. This is also medium layer um, expeditions as well. Camp shoes, some people don't want to be wearing shoes, so they kind of, uh, they call booties. I mean, they just put it on um, to keep themselves warm. Um, these are called gators, so this this has this is all protective, right? So it prevents any snow getting in. Um, it also kind of prevents any water sometimes to get up as well. The way you manage your socks is you put one layer first and then you put another uh, different thickness layer on the other side. If it is really good winter, I put a very thick layer. Um, a, a liner is very, very important because otherwise you will get blisters because of the rub that happens in all these shoes. These shoes are very, very stiff. This shoe does not bend here like the other shoes. That's the reason why, because when you want to kick a step into the snow, you want this to be very stiff. You don't want this to be bending um, and lose your footing very well, right? So that's why these, these soles are very, made very stiff. Uh, these are waterproof all the way through up to here. Um, so in that, and then you put on this gait on the top to protect it further as well, and it also gives cold. One of the biggest issues with the shoes is, of course, you sweat inside. Um, so you can't always put on like, okay, well, I'm going to put like two or three socks to keep myself big. No, uh, actually, it's the other way. You want your feet to breathe as well. Um, so uh, don't put a, like a plastic uh, wrap around your shoe and that will actually will not let you breathe and you will sweat yourself and you get wet by your sweat yourself. Um, some tips that I've learned uh, is when, when it is like minus 15 degrees outside, you don't want to leave your shoe outside. Because once the shoe is frozen, it, um, you cannot, I mean, unfreeze a shoe within hours. Um, that's one of the biggest issues. A lot of what we do is we put it in a polythene bag or a bag and keep it inside my sleeping bag, which is the warmest place in, in the tent. Um, right. And so most of the sleeping bags are six feet plus. Uh, for me, I'm five, 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 so I have enough room to put a, a bag of shoes at the bottom. So I use that space to store certain things, like even the canister, uh, fuel canisters as well. 
Uh, the other thing is that uh, when you get to the camp, don't keep the shoes tied this way. It is actually the opposite way. You want the blood to circulate your body. Uh, so actually untie your shoe completely and leave it open um, so that your blood starts. When you use this, when you're walking, it's okay because you're generating heat and other things. When you're just standing still at a camp, untie these ones as well. Traction, I think a lot of you guys know, this is called crampons, which are the most important thing that creates uh, there are multiple types of crampons. This is kind of an ice crampon, uh, heavy duty crampon. This is normal glacier crampons. Uh, some skiing rice, this is called micro spikes. You can just put it on any shoe, um, still have small spikes, and of course, small shoes as well. Um, and of course, weight changes. This is probably maybe a pound. This, each one is a pound and a half. Um, these ones are two and a half pounds. This is, of course, uh, skis. Um, I'm not a skier. Um, so, any questions on the traction side? Hey, Vishnu, this is Abhishek. Hey, yeah. uh, hey man, uh, I'm, I'm told that, uh, you know, by the way, I don't do technical climb, but I'm told that the, the sort of move from technical to, I'm sorry, from, from hiking to a technical climb is basically this traction or sort of, you know, ability to use some of these things is where um, the biggest gap is. Like, so people say, look, if you were to graduate from trekking to the next stage, uh, you know, this slide is the, is the, is that, is that transition slide. Is that true? That's first? correct. Um, yeah, good, uh, good comment, Abhishek. Um, so the traction okay. device, so uh, it's not as e easy enough to wear it and walk. Um, no, um, you will actually trip. Uh, it is very, uh, it's not normal. Uh, way you do with attraction and walk. I mean, once you get used to it, it becomes very easy. Uh, the first thing is, those spikes are very sharp. They catch on your on your pants. They they tear your pants up. Right, first thing, uh, of course, which is bad for any hiking and other things. You trip a lot. Um, so, and the way you climb is there are like six or seven methods to climb a slope. We call French cut. We call pointed uh, French cut as well. All these things you learn when you go to kind of a mountaineering class or you go with people that who knows how to do mountaineering as well. So the way you walk, like for example, this guy is walking, um, like the slope is this way, you walk this. So he's kind of, this, he takes this foot and puts it to the next one to this step. Um, and then he takes it, he kind of uh, switches one after the other. Uh, this is the slowest way that you can climb a slope. Um, there is a German way, um, I forgot the word which they use, they, one foot is pointing in and one foot is pointing this way. Um, so in that way, this gives the traction, you can go leap forward a lot more further. The other ones, just people point the foot and then do, but you gotta have a very strong caps in order to do that. Uh, there is a humongous ways and then you do like a zigzag uh, as well. Uh, ways and these are all different techniques for different types of terrains. If it is icy, if it is slushy, slushy snow. Uh, going up is the half the bottle in battle. Coming down is absolutely so. Going up, these are the front teeth that works. While coming down, these the back teeth are the ones that works for you. Um, so you got to learn on both sides how to use them as well. Uh, yes, that this this will change the difference between a normal hiker versus a mountaineer. Right, and one last one. It's not like you can just put it on and say, "Okay, I'm gonna go um, uh, hike up, uh, you know, Mount Whitney now." And it's, it's it's like you have to get trained in this, right? It's and you know, it's kind of yeah, yep. Yeah. Yeah. And some people may have it naturally. I mean, they figure it out, right? Once or two mistakes they have done, but do those mistakes at low heights and in our safer places. Wherever there is snow, you can just go use them. Where the resides, you can just go use them. That's that's how you just get learned to do it. Uh, one of the biggest issue is when you're when you have a fall, these are the ones that rips your body apart too. So you got to be careful when you are sliding down this hill by by mistake you're falling. If this comes in the middle, you actually topple uh, like a roll roll over because this is stopping you from the throne, but your upper body is actually moving fast. So you you kind of create a leap of the body and you fly high in the air. Uh, so you got to know clearly how to use them, where it needs to be used, when to use it um, as well. Yes, this is a technical area where you have to be trained. Um, as you said, it's not just put on and walk, walk it through. Snowshoes probably may get there. I mean, you'll, you'll have to walk with a little bit wider stance and a little bit. Micro spikes is probably not much big. Um, 
I would say try to go to micro spikes, which is easy way, and then start going into this ones, and then go into this one. Um, the more points you have, the more instability also you have. It's the opposite way. Um, uh, lesser points you have, the more you feel closer to the ground. The more points you have, you're further up to the ground. Imagine you got a shoe that is three centimeters thick, and this one keeps you another three centimeters. So you're high off the ground already. So your center of gravity has risen, right? So your body is at a different stage now. Um, so all these things changes when you are in terrain. So practice and practice makes, uh, uh, let you know. Other stuff, these are the most important things. I call it other stuff, but uh, since I didn't want to spend too much time. So kind of harness, this is what it ties you from buddy to buddy. Uh, ropes, you carry other stuff along with it for any climbing. Biggest thing is shovel. I showed you this big picture, but this is a one and a half pound that you carry. Rope is one of the biggest weight. This is seven pounds to eight pounds that you carry. It is a 60 meter rope. Uh, baklava for to protect your face. Uh, beanie caps. This is the ice axe. Normal ice axe, a lot of people use for mountaineer. There's a normal snow, snow things or other things. Uh, this is the first step for any ice axe that you use, use very good ice axe, uh, like work cars. And uh, your snow poles, and uh, uh, if it is slushy snow, then you use these baskets underneath so that these poles doesn't poke through and you get uh, some protection defense back from snow. This one I'll show you later on when this is called picket. Uh, why you use this is uh, to create anchors if someone has fallen into crevasse or when, when you want to get someone out as well. So getting trained and carrying all this is also a skill. Um, and buying this, trying to find the bu buying the right item, what's the lightest weight, what is the strengths wise, looking at all these things. It takes time. I mean, um, and you spend enough time, you see videos, you learn from others, you go on climbs, learn, make mistakes that way as well. Um, slowly I'll start shifting into a little bit of uh, fun stuff, I would say. <laughs> Um, some of these pictures, yeah, I think most of the pictures are mine here. Um, so dangers of mountaineering, right? So it just, mountaineering does, is not always the fun stuff, but I mean, it is fun stuff as long as you're very watchful, you're physically fit, you're mentally strong, you know exactly what's happening and when to back off, when to go forward, right? If you are in those conditions, mountaineering is absolutely fun. But if any of those things does not work, then do not, be in that area or don't try, uh, get first, get those things taken care of. Weather and lack of visibility. This is the, one of the worst things called whiteout, why navigation is very important for us. Uh, the, um, so this was a picture, I, uh, this is Mount Rainier, 15,000 feet. It was, I think, probably around 12,000 feet, okay? We were planning to summit the day. Um, in 10 minutes, um, even though I saw the weather forecast and everything, I was prepared for everything. In 10 minutes, this is how the clouds or kind of white wood starts coming in. And you can see, I cannot see anything forward. There was, there is a mountain right behind us, exactly. This, this is how the weather can change in the mountains. And this is why navigation, your maps are very, very important. If in this conditions, I cannot see where to go, if it is actually, I mean, I was lucky enough, I could take, get a picture of it, uh, right? So you gotta be prepared for these conditions. And, and of course, we decided that it is not the right time to go to the summit. We walked away. So be be that brave person too. I mean, it's okay not to go. I mean, mountains will be there. Uh, we want to make sure that you are there uh, to go for the next time. Uh, exposure fog. So when I say exposure, this is called exposure. This is called a traverse. A lot of times we use safety equipments, roping, uh, running belays um, as well when you try to walk across this type of steep tra traverses. But this is where real, uh, you got to be really careful. Even if you try to arrest fall, um, you would not be able to. Um, I think on a mountaineer's route, Abhishek, uh, there is a traverse um, like this, okay? Uh, and this kind of prevents a lot of people using mountaineer's route uh, versus the John, uh, versus the Whitney Trail route uh, in, in the winter time. So these are crevasses. I think a lot of people know crevasses and molines where water comes in um, and creates a big hole. I think I showed that previously. We'll talk about crevasses a little later. These are some of the dangers of the mountains. I mean, um, this is where a fall could happen, um, falling into crevasse. 
weather would would change automatically on you. Avalanche is one of the other issues. I think I'll, I'll start with the Everest avalanche that killed 13 Sherpas in one one day. Um, this is a picture I pulled off from internet, not my picture. You know, same scenarios exist where I traveled. I mean, Mount Baker. This is this is an ice where a big chunk of uh, uh, fall comes in, and of course, Everest has bigger more, uh, but this was a smaller uh, mountain. So, and then uh, you get seracs, like these are ice seracs, right? When these collapse, you don't want to be here because these are big boulders of rock coming through, and you don't, you're you just standing on attraction, right? They will wipe you out um, and knock, knock things off. Other thing, ice fall could be as bad as like this, okay? This is the Kumbu ice fall, I think a lot of India. If you are familiar about Mount Everest, you will know what Kumbu Ice Fall is. It is one of the worst areas to travel. Lots of deaths happen. A lot of times people don't think about animals. Uh, this animal is called marmot. I think a lot of, there's a brand called marmot as well. Uh, the reason why this is important, or even a bear, right? They are so attracted to human food. Uh, they can smell even the toothpaste uh, tube. They can smell it. They bite into your tent, they bite into your backpack. So imagine you lose your tent in some form or your backpack is a big hole uh, for your climb tomorrow. So that will kill your mountaineer uh, right there. So be just be careful of these. You try to avoid these elements where you carry a bear canister, you gotta carry a wood sack, we call it, um, sometimes which is like made with Teflons. Uh, some of these that cannot bite as well. So just this was right beside my tent. That's why I took the picture on this Mount Baker, uh, which is the same place where these ones were taken as well. Um, hypothermia. Uh, um, this is a very interesting fact. I wasn't aware until I got in mountaineering when I saw this. Now, normal body temperature is 98.498 plus, right? When you start getting in 97, there's one degree difference, right? Um, and you saw the wind chill, 30 minutes, you are pretty much wind chills wise. So wind is blowing and other things. Even one degree fall, you start shivering. And then four degrees fall, you start getting amnesia. This is the effect of hypothermia. So a lot of people underestimate hypothermia. When someone um, have an issue on a mountaineering and they can't walk or other things, the biggest danger is hypothermia. So that's why the emergency blanket I was talking about, the aluminum wrap or anything like that, or your insulation clothes and other things. This is the reason why we try to go after. Just 15 degrees. This takes probably less than 45 minutes if you are sitting still in a mountaineer of a, like a cold weather. 15 minutes, you will be able to get here. Um, so you got to kind of move your limbs. You got to kind of do some things like that. So this is the reason why a lot of people die. Um, it's not because, I mean, yeah, they broke a bone, uh, but they, uh, the body starts, they need heat, the best ways of heat. That's why having a flask of water, hot water, some form to take with you, even though it's heavy, flask, you got to take uh, heat with you. Um, or some form, create a heat. Um, sometimes when you bunk down for because of you have a very bad weather, you got to light that stuff up, drink hot liquid, then you will, you would not get this hypothermia. Next one is frostbite. I think a lot of people know uh, frostbite. It can be as worse as just uh, getting fingernails taken care of, <laughs> or uh, it's a very bad uh, bones. I mean, you, your skin is pretty much frozen and dying, right? Uh, the other issue is altitude sickness. There were lots of questions on the survey as well about altitude sickness. So I'll take some time uh, for a bit. Normal sea level, and when you get to Mount Everest, right, 29,600 now, I think. So one third of your oxygen is only available there. Um, so that's the major issue. What happens when the oxygen is, uh, is low? Your body produces a lot of red blood corpuscles, RBCs. Uh, so when more RBCs are there, the blood is very thick. Um, so that means heart has to work very, very hard to pump that very thick blood across the body. So body decides to send the blood only to certain areas, not on all places, because body is meant that way. Um, and some of the limbs don't get the, and so it stops giving blood to the digestion areas. Okay, so you lose our appetite once you get into the altitudes. That's why you see the signs of altitude sickness. And you don't feel like eating when you get into very high altitudes very easily. And um, like uh, sometimes the blood 
get so thick inside your brain nerves and the, the capillaries, it starts expanding in there and cause cerebral edema, even explode sometimes in the brain, which is the most severe, dangerous situations for attitudes. Right? Uh, the things that I'm talking about is not like, uh, I mean, happens at 15,000 or anything, but these are some things that we have to be aware of even for, uh, the biggest issue altitude is not, uh, if you spend at 15,000 feet, you're okay uh, for a day or two, which is called acclimatization. But if you go from sea level to 15,000 feet in a one day, that and do some exercising while going up, that is the issue that causes altitude sickness. You can just take a nice plane, land in a 15,000 um, feet airport, which is uh, uh, Lostep in Nepal, and you don't have an altitude sickness because you're not exercising anything. You spend a night or five days there, people exercise for that height, then go to 20,000 feet or 17,000 or 18,000 for base camp. Then they start putting like three or four camps, go up and down in order to reduce their altitude sickness, right? So oxygen is very, very important. Uh, all of these signs are possible. Um, why people call it a death zone above this uh, 25,000 feet is you cannot acclimatize more because the body cannot produce any RBCs blood carpsons anymore. That's why it's called death zone. Um, and your body starts dying because the cells are dying after that. You can book, uh, you can prevent altitude sickness. Um, there is called pressure breathing. Um, uh, I think if you, you Google it, you will know it's fast breath intake and excel very, very rapidly. So what you're doing is you're increasing the amount of oxygen in your lungs. The more your lungs, you're trying to expand your lungs twice its size. Um, I don't know if there, the fact is we use only 20% of our lung capacity um, in normal breathings. So when you do pressure breathing, you can get up to 50 to 60% of your lung capacity, um, which can help you survive in these, in these ones. Um, when you are exercising, uh, I think if, if you're a gym freak, a lot of people talk about VO2 max, anaerobic exercises, aerobic exercises, right? right? A lot of times aerobic, you would have heard anaerobic and VO2 is like where your max heart rate is. A lot of times max heart rates are for our ages, we are around 160 to 170. Uh, spending some time there, uh, do not spend too much time because that's very bad for your body. Uh, very like a minute or so in VO2s, getting back to anaerobic zones and maybe five minutes there, to a couple of minutes there, and then in getting back to aerobic zones wise, will help you train your body to react to high uh, need of oxygen as well. Um, hypoxic training, there is multiple equipments that are there that kind of gives a mask that reduces the amount of oxygen. So you sleep overnight with a mask on or a tent, kind of a vacuum vacuum chamber tent where uh, some oxygen is. In. These are multiple ways you can get oxygen. Um, but altitude sickness could vary. Um, there was a hike where I did not feel altitude sickness at 15,000 feet, but I felt altitude sickness very badly at 10,000 feet. It all depends upon what you ate in the, the day before, the amount of water you drank. Water circulation is very important. Hydration helps in altitude sickness, actually, because you're thinning your blood. Um, that's why when altitude sickness, they prescribe the medicine called a diomox, which is nothing but a blood thinner, aspirin, blood thinners. And all these things are helping the blood to be thinned uh, for this altitude. So altitude makes a big difference in life. Um, and of course, that's why mountaineering is important. And you got to be prepared for altitude sickness in proper ways. So physical strength is very important. And how do you manage your breathing is very important as well. So I know I went so through very fast now. This is all general. Sure. So from now, I'll change the topic a little bit. So any questions till now? So I have one. Manage this, altitude this sickness? Go ahead, Akshay. No, 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 I, uh, please, please, no, I, I'll, I'll wait. Okay, so how, when you say you have altitude sickness at 10,000 feet, so what what, are, what do you do next? Uh, 10,000 feet, yeah, the first thing is, if you think there is an issue that you feel, I mean, not you won't feel this type of things, you will have a headache for sure, okay? Uh, you, you feel dehydrated quite a bit. Uh, you feel uh, nausea. I mean, these are kind of small symptoms. Um, if you... If, if you can rest for 30 minutes and see if it goes away, then it's great. And if it does not go away, then please do not go up. That's the only solution. You cannot beat altitude sickness. Um, that's, that's a given fact. The only way to overcome altitude sickness is spend more time at the high altitude and sleep at a lower altitude.
come back and sleep, and then go back next day to the higher altitude. You will feel much better that way. So you get to train your body to create the RBC, red blood carbocells, um, and then come back, sleep, so you have enough RBCs, your, your body is still maintained, and then you go back the next day higher. That's why when you see all these Mount Everest times, as they go for camp one, come back down to base camp time two, and then come back down to base camp as your body is getting optimized. But if you see any signs of headaches or nausea or anything, do not climb any more higher up. Um, a lot you of don't people- take a, You uh, don't take a pill and keep going up. No, um, a pill could, I mean, yeah, an aspirin could help you with a little bit of the headache, but it's gonna mask your uh, symptoms. Uh, I prefer not to take a pill. If it is a bad day, yeah, it's a bad day. Take a hit, take a hit and go down, right? I mean, some days are good. Uh, some days you don't feel much, you, you can climb a little more. But that's why, and the problem with altitude is, you probably may not know you have altitude sickness. Your friend will know. The way you're walking, the way, you're, uh, the way you swell when you're walking, which is the most dangerous. The problem is the altitude sickness, uh, it will kind of stop your physical coordination too sometimes. You lose mental consciousness. Um, I have a story that I'll share with you. Um, a simple mountain, the Mount Shasta, which is similar, 14,000, which is the same as Whitney. Um, a friend of mine and me were going, and uh, uh, we were climbing up, and he never ate because, I mean, he started, oh, yeah, well, I'm not going to go anymore. I'm going to sit here. You guys go ahead. I'm done for the day. Uh, he made a great decision, I, we thought, but then immediately realized, like, no, he was not making a great decision because altitude sickness, he decided that uh, he's, he's too hot, he's taking his layers off, even though it was freezing outside, he's mentally disoriented. So our biggest thing was to get him down as soon as possible. So we got him down and then we climbed again the next day and he was fine, right? So make those decisions very clearly. Altitude sickness wow. will not improve as you go higher that. on. Okay, you make a decision that, yes, I'm gonna go down uh, because that is not gonna change as you go higher up. There is a book actually, Altitude um, Illness Prevention and Treatment, very great book, and it also helps you to learn about how to prevent, how to kind of uh, train yourself for altitudes and other things as well. Hey, Vishnu, this Abhishek, man, one, one question on this. By the way, this is, I wish I, I had uh, this slide or this conversation uh, two years ago. Yeah, I think I, I as I mentioned, I, I think that's probably the biggest reason people don't submit, as you mentioned, right? You have to come down, there's, yeah. nothing, there's nothing you could do. But one question here, um, see, when you, um, when you are on a day hike uh, type of thing where you start whatever, 3 a.m., 4 a.m., and then want to finish before weather goes bad at the summit, uh, you essentially have eight to nine hours to, uh, you know, uh, there's, no, there's no opportunity to acclimatize, right? So how mm -hmm. do you, again, people do take medication. I've seen some, some people, uh, they just do fine, but like, I mean, on a day hike, how do you solve this acclimatization problem and still be able to submit? Yeah, so the lesser amount of time you spend, anything about it, altitude sickness starts around 8,000 feet, okay? Um, up below 8,000 feet, there is no danger. 8,000 to 10,000 feet, that's when you start feeling it. You lose energy in the, in, uh, and then you slow down when you walk and that type of stuff. Yes, you can push through up to 10,000 feet, okay? Or even 12,000 feet, but don't spend too much time there. Uh, it's not gonna get better. Like for example, Whitney, a lot of people, what they do is, oh, it's only headache, let me take an aspirin. And then they try to push further and further up. Um, once they get to the 13,000 feet, then really the altitude sickness really hits them. They can't, even the pill won't change that. Um, they have to go back because of that altitude sickness. That's the ones, the smart people who tries to go back. But if they continue to go up, um, it, it's very tough. I mean, every person is different, first thing. And you may lose your life because one step wrong could make you fall. Um, this altitude sickness could disorient you significantly. Um, it creates actually even hypothermia because your blood is not pumping as fast as it's supposed to be for as well. So altitude sickness has so many issues. Vishnu, do you recommend medication? I mean, because um, apparently many people who did take the medication actually did did just fine. I mean, it might just be a sample error. Who knows? But, yeah, I mean, so now 15,000, I think you may be able to get away with uh, some medication, right? But you got to address the core issue of altitude sickness. Your body has to be able to take 
more oxygen or live with less oxygen when you're exercising, right? Um, you got to train. I mean, up to 15,000, there is not much of an issue as long as you don't spend too much time there by taking medication. Um, you take a medication in the morning, you go up to Whitney at the top by in the afternoon, like one o'clock, and then, yeah, you come back down by the, by the night. That's okay. You can take an aspirin or diamox or something like that and then go come down. But if you plan to sleep on Whitney for a day or two there and your, your, your altitude sickness is not improving, that's not the time to take more medication to reduce it. Um, so first thing, what I generally do for Whitney, in case if I'm, I'm, I'm not trained enough, I will try to go uh, up to 9,000 or 10,000 feet uh, on Whitney. Um, so I think it starts around 6,000 uh, uh, camp-wise, uh, Whitney portals start at 6,000 or 7,000 something. I go up to 10,000 or 11,000, depends upon Iceberg Lake or uh, I don't know, your trail. Then I sleep there. Um, if I if it is not improving, I come down. I sleep one more at the camp itself. So now I have trained my body to get more RBCs in me, but I have I gain all my energy back by coming down to lower altitude. Now I have a significant opportunity and better chances to make the summit. Um, so keep an extra day. It's okay to go up and come back down and sleep lower. Climb high and sleep low makes acclimatization go away very, very quickly. And a lot of people just go and sleep there and say like, okay, man, it's not going away. It's not going away. No, we have to go down in order to uh, uh, take advantage of the acclimatization. But not everyone is, everyone is different. Some people climb up to 30,000 feet without even man, uh, right, oxygen. Some people, they need two cylinders of oxygen to go up, right? Everyone is different and how they are trained also makes them different. Vishnu, given how extreme this is, is there something like a 911 for mountaineers? Um, this SOS, um, the, the, um, the Garmin and Reach and other stuff, the equipment that you carry, there is a button called SOS. Uh, of course, yeah, it depends but on the altitude. Service, that, yeah. that kind of sends a chopper in and picks you up. If you <laughs> want, want uh, to, uh... A chopper can go, the majority of the rescue choppers can go maybe 15,000 to 16,000. Worst case scenario, if it is a very light chopper, maybe 18,000 max. There is nothing that takes you above 18,000 and can lift you off. That's the reason why people leave someone behind on Mount Everest, because there is no way someone can get them down. Uh, That's exactly. the reason most of us will only watch your photos. <laughs> um, yeah, the, so SOS is, is very important. I mean, but uh, if you are in a very high altitude, most of the conditions are pretty bad. I'll show you some pictures of winds, how bad they can be um, on once you get into the high altitudes. A chopper or anything would be very tough unless you've got a group of friends that can help you to get down. Yeah. A lot of friends on those high altitudes, they got to care for themselves. I mean, if you if you are in a slope that I, I travel slope that there are, there is no one who is going to carry. Um, so uh, there are some rescues to do manually as well, but choppers, um, 18,000. Um, and SOS is free, by the way. Um, so a lot of people think that the cost of an SOS for the government is $40,000, so 15 to 40,000 depends upon what they are. Um, so a lot of volunteers, actually, when they get an SOS call, a lot of volunteers within the area, they try to go and save tax dollars uh, being spent on someone uh, rescued as well. 15,000 is probably easier for rescue. Uh, of course, it depends on the weather, absolutely. But no one wants to go up rescue someone when the weather is bad and put themselves in danger as well. So, um, so sometimes when someone makes an SOS, it's, it doesn't happen within two minutes, like a 911. It could be two days out. Um, so be prepared for that. That's why your 10 essentials are very important, which includes food, insulation, heat, everything, uh, how to survive there. Um, change of topic, a little bit of glacier study, also a little bit general knowledge. Um, um, I think the way glaciers are formed, I think everyone knows you more snowfalls, they keep coming down because of the weight of the snow. Um, the biggest uh, uh, crevasse in a glacier is called Bergeschen, which is a German board. Um, this is where the heavy weight of this uh, snow rips off from the foot edges of the hills or the mountains wise. 
um, this is this could prevent you from going up um, because there's no way around it sometimes unless you go high up or some forms. Uh, the other things that I would say is uh, the glacier has a very nice uh, glaciology, they call it. So I think someone who is a mineral is metal. Um, so the concave and convex shapes helps you quite a bit to uh, decide where the crevasses are, where the crevasses won't be. Anything outside, which is kind of curving like this outside, will break the ice out. Anything which is curved inside is, will not break the ice. Uh, if there is like a, an elevation, like a going up like this, up, it breaks the ice because it has to go up. And then when it falls, that's when the crevasses form. When you are getting into like a compression zone, there is no crevasse here. So you, you probably need to know how a glacier looks like clearly and be able to decide whether there is a crevasse or not. Uh, a lot of times, you, uh, I mean, if you travel enough, you'll be able to see um, and rescue yourself and you can go around the crevasse sometimes or kind of tread lightly, uh, be careful with your partners how when they are going. Um, knowing glacier, how they form, how the glaciers are, is very, very important. And I think I showed you what mullins are. These are big holes all the way from the top of the bottom, and then the water comes out at the bottom here. Um, now there are some aretas, they call it, I and mean, then uh, kind of uh, gullies. Uh, we use this for ice climbing a lot of times, but this is also a big issue uh, for uh, avalanches. There are some glacier lakes that falls, and we got rock falls and other things. We'll talk about that later. The biggest issue with crevasses is they are hidden. You sometimes will not know um, because even if there is a... So during the uh, fall season, this is the worst area to be in mountains. Uh, the reason is summer has broken up these crevasses significantly because some of the ice has melted, they start moving down and they break these crevasses. They open up like this, what you see, this is in July. Uh, but when the snow falls, this they start slowly covering this, like a small um, like snow bridge. Like for example, here it covered this big crevasse here. You would not know that there is a crevasse underneath. If the snow is not too much, you fall into crevasse. That's why you gotta be very careful of these snow bridges. The snow bridge, the other issue with this is in the morning when you're going up, it's very nice, tight, firm snow because it's frozen overnight, right? But when you're coming down, it's a mid afternoon, the sun is shining on it, very hot. The snow bridge would have fallen down. So if you believe that going up is easy, coming down, you gotta always think of coming down too. Will that snow bridge be there when I'm coming down? Otherwise you can't cross. Um, so you gotta be very careful when you know there is a snow bridge. Um, here, you can see this is a snow bridge here, okay? Uh, the one that we used to crack. But when we kind of walked through this, we got to be, uh, we know like in case of this falls, there is another route for me to go around, uh, right? So you got to be careful when you look at this. This is very clean snow bridge, I, I know. Uh, but if this is covered with uh, this one, you fall through a lot of crevasse issues happens is because this hidden crevasse is because of the snow light snow that happens. Fall is the worst time for these uh, crevasse issues. Um, this is one of the biggest training that you get in a mountaineering, how to pull someone out of a crevasse. Uh, we talk about signs here. Um, a lot of people have learned about in 10th grade up even in, in college, uh, two is to one, three is to one pulley system, six is to one pulley systems. Uh, how to split the load anchors, uh, what is the angle of the anchors, if it's too far, how does all these things comes into play. And imagine you get to do this in 30, 40 miles wind coming, beating across you at minus 15 degrees, you can't take gloves off and everything, you got to put all this and, and pull your friend out. That's the situation that you're in. So that means you got to train this many, many times in normal conditions so that you can do this by uh, in the back of your hand. Very important for mountaineering. If you don't know this, your partner will not take with you uh, because he, his life is on you for him to rescue, for me to rescue. So if I don't know how to pull him off, if he falls in, he will not be your partner for mountaineering. So they actually try to do, reconfirm themselves how much they know and before they do. Anchoring system, this is a significant knowledge and the training that you go how to build an anchoring system how much deep this has to be, depends upon the snow conditions, how much you dig deep. These are all things that you learn through this mountaineering class or when you go through this twice. And uh, if you use a six, let's say three is to one 
you, you reduce your force of pulling this 200 pound guy uh, by three is to one, 60 pounds you're pulling, which is probably easier to pull. Uh, but if you pull three feet here, he's only coming up one feet. And you got all these frictions too. Remember uh, the rope is going against the snow, uh, cut into the groove of the ice. All these things matter. So that means you have to come up with a system like, hey, this guy is too heavy. The snow is too compact. I mean, it's crunching that I can't pull the rope out. So I have to immediately change from twos to one to threes to one, or even sixes to one sometimes um, as well. There are other rescues, like he himself, if I set up this anchor, if he's close enough, if he's not like 50 feet down, let's say, then he can pull himself up. Um, there is called self-rescue, like uh, climbing a rope. I think you'll see some of the videos, we um, talk about that later. So this is a must skill set. Any mountaineer should know this, um, if he's going on mountains wise. There are multiple ways to do it. Uh, a lot of the weight that you carry for mountaineering comes from these crevasse rescue. You carry a picket, you can ice axe, of course, is there. You carry these slings, you carry carabiners, you carry the rope, uh, and all these things, how you tie the rope. The biggest thing is everyone, it's great when in normal conditions, as I said, it's, it is worse. You would not remember even a single step sometimes just when the conditions are bad. And you're, you're, you're you're helpless too because your friend is dying on the other side, hanging off of a rope, and you, he's only relying on you to save his life. That's the key situation that you're in. So trust is very important, and training on this one is very, very important. Um, I, I have to make sure that my partner knows this, otherwise I would not go with someone. Oh, coming to the wonderful things of knots. Uh, these are just basic knots. There are many other knots in mountaineering. Uh, hey, Vishnu, Vishnu, can I interrupt you, man, for a second? Sure, sure. Hey, um, before we jump to knots, which is kind of a big topic in itself, uh, can we take a small uh, detour and um, and uh, go a little personal? Tell us, man, how, uh, you know, what made you um, the, the, the KREC Vishnu to this rock climber, rock star, Vishnu, I mean, like this is, this is, uh, you know, I mean, I think I would say probably of our batch, you probably are the only one who, I mean, I was looking at these slides. I'm like, man, uh, probably I, you know, I, I don't even know if you probably be ever uh, be able to use some of these things, but we can definitely use the motivation from you. Like, tell us your journey of the sure. crawl walk run, right? What got you started? What made you sort of on yeah. it, right? I mean, for me, you know, some of these things. So, I do have a slide how I got into mountaineering uh, later. Okay. Um, I'm trying to rush through to get the GK out, or general knowledge out as much as I can. Um, the reason why I'm doing this is uh, a mountaineering is not walking just on snow and ice. There is years, um, sometimes months, and training that goes behind. Um, as I said, perseverance, right, is one of the key things. You got to be mentally strong. Physical strength is okay, but if you are not mentally strong, uh, it's very tough to do this mountaineering. Uh, I'm not saying I'm good at it, okay? There's lots of areas. And then, this is a science. This is like a college. Uh, people spend years to do this and get perfect at this. Uh, I'm, I'm trying to create this awareness um, so that this is a sport. This is a life, too, for a lot of people who make livings out of this by teaching, by training people and other things. And, of course, some people do it for fun. Uh, I'll talk about that, Abhishek, why I got into mountaineering. Of course, a beer and pizza was one of the first initiators for me to get there. Um, but I'll, I'll uh, certainly will address the topic, how I got in. Um, I'll talk about knots. I mean, everyone's seen knots. Uh, these knots are the most important things that will save your life. The first thing is you got to do these knots with the gloves. Um, so it's not bare fingers uh, because in mountaineering, everything is frozen for you already. You got to do this with your frozen fingers and everything. And you have to do this blindly. So the way I do it, I'm mean, just giving an example. This is my uh, place where I'm sitting right now. Underneath my desk, there is always a rope here, a carabiner. I practice this blindly while just it's my way of fidgeting um, like other people do. I can tie any, uh, luckily to now I have learned enough that I can tie any of this knot blindly and potentially with a glove. Um, out of these knots, this is to load sharing. Uh, you tie in, in between a knot to yourself. This is at the end of the rope you tie. This is uh, kind of creating just a normal simple knot. This is a lot of people use it. 
This is a tow hitch, which is used to stop yourself from rope going up and down. Um, to tie two ends of the knot uh, rope, this is connecting yourself into the rope through a figure eight wise, which is where a lot of rock climbers use. Um, this is like a kind of a belay system. If you don't have a belay device, you use this. This is the most important knot to save your life. Um, you use friction to go uh, to kind of hold the weight of a person. Um, so there are multiple ways of doing a press I and mean, this is just one one way. And of course, tucker sitch, a lot of trucks guys, how they tie down the load, we use the same thing. So for example, from here, I use a tucker sitch to tie this knot down here, and this is a claw hitch uh, here. I practice this uh, just for my way of fidgeting, right? I mean, that's how much, uh, I mean, maybe it's a passion that you consider or say, or the effort that you have to put in in order to do this. I mean, Knowing a knot is different, but doing it in the worst, like worst conditions with gloves on is a different story. Uh, imagine you, your whole life's friend, your friend's life is on you to save him. The minutes you waste, the minutes um, he is uh, he's struggling. Um, so always learn about these knots as well. Uh, okay, getting into fitness. Um, this is uh, kind of uh, why, how uh, I'm gonna show some examples. I mean, I'm not saying I'm just fit, okay, but at least I try to get there uh, every day. Physical strength is, of course, one area. Mental strength is important always, but I'm going to talk about physical strength. These are some areas. You should be capable of burning five to 6,000 calories a day. I mean, if you can do that, then I think you, have, you, have, you should be able to carry 45 pounds back for eight hours. Um, these are normal. You should be able to climb 1,500 feet with 35 pounds back in one hour, right? Uh, and you do all this and you repeat the same hike the next day, then I think you feel like, okay, yes, I, I, I might be able to conquer some good mountains up here around here. Yes, cold winds are there. Uh, this is a typical training schedule. This is only for 18,000 feet or Denali, uh, 19,000, actually 19,782 feet uh, training, which is exactly how people train for them to go for this type of uh, cardio, strength, and flexibility doing 60, 90 minutes or two hours of training every day, and of course, and you do a hike. The way I hike, I, I build my fitness is I spend more time on the weekend uh, for longer, bigger hikes. And then I, I run every other day or do weight lifts or rock climbing every, uh, like Tuesday and Thursday is rock climbing, gym wise, one, one day are open now. Uh, Monday, Wednesday is sometimes I run, Friday is my rest day so that I can have full energy for Saturday and Sunday big hikes. This is an example of a hike that I did. So total time is 14 hours moving time. 19 hours we were on the hike. I burned 6,863 calories. And of course, this is a very slow pace of mine, but roughly you're doing a 30 minute mile, 27 miles a day. Um, this is the type of uh, stability that you need. I, I'm not good like this every day. But I was lucky the day I was able to do it. This is, I mean, everyday body, needs around 2000 calories. We are burning three times, three times, three days of energy in, in a few hours. That's what your body should be able to be able to do. Um, some results of my hikes this year, um, um, I have done 37 hikes in 2020. Um, because of COVID, there were some uh, closures in some places, so that's why I couldn't go higher. I have done 13 peaks and the two summits I walked away because of the bad weathers. Um, totally right now, I'm, I'm rounding around 450 miles of uh, climbing uh, till now. So uh, that's the kind of effort that I have put in myself to be, uh, to see this nice world, the other side of the world, uh, that a lot of uh, people um, see on nice uh, scenery pictures and other things as well. One of the greatest advantage of this fitness is called resting heart rate. I think a lot of people who are gym freaks here know what a resting heart rate is. But why that is very important is a resting heart rate generally, if a normal human being with not good exercises or anything, they will be around 60, 65. And not, of course, the guy who doesn't have high cholesterol is another thing. If you're a mountaineer, your resting heart rate comes to even close to 50. That is a very, very great advantage for long life. Uh, your heart is not pumping as much. Um, and you have more room for the heart to produce more oxygen and give you. 
so when this i have seen some people who have resting heart rates to even low 40s as well um, my resting heart rate used to be around 65 68 when the worst the worst times of my life but now i think when the recent range 55 to 50 sometimes 50 52 something like that which is a good place i feel um, so this makes a big difference this is called long life uh, uh, metric or monitor sometimes so Resting heart rate is nothing but you're not doing anything, so just laying down, taking your heart rate. What does that look like, right? That's what uh, you improve this, you actually reduce this heart rate, your body is doing much better um, as well. So you, um, because you're doing this anaerobic VO2 exercises, the resting heart rate comes down significantly to help you. So physical fitness is a big factor, of course, mountaineering, where we already talked about mental strength quite a bit. Um, this is the type of stuff that we have to do uh, in order to be fit. Uh, am I, do I have six pack and I have like muzzle everywhere and zero fat? Absolutely not. Okay. <laughs> I still have a belly. Okay. I mean, every mountaineer is, does not have a six pack. I still have a belly. It, it's, uh, it's the condition of your body, right? I mean, um, some of my friends even call me a fat. I mean, that's okay. Uh, it's, it's I, I eat more than I bought. Um, that's I love food. That's why I like mountain. Uh, that's one of the reasons I eat a lot. Even when I go up, I eat two meals, whereas other people will be eating only one meal. I don't know why my body needs more food. I, I think I, I love food. Um, so that gives an opportunity for you to eat more uh, mountain. Well, oh, this is one of the biggest things that I do once I before I start. A lot of people take this very easy. Oh, let's the night before they try to plan cram everything like the last last minute session, right? Uh, one of the things that uh, we spend a lot of time going to a mountain, um, uh, at least two, three weeks of work. Uh, we look at weather, which is the most important thing. Of course, temperatures makes an important deal. The most important is wind. We talked about wind, uh, where you can see there is 20 miles of wind that is coming from south, uh, 15 miles coming from north. You can see the wind is changing the direction as you come to the middle of the week, you, you have a significant wind force called gale forces, 55. If they say 55 here, sometimes they could be 90 because it's called gust wind. Sometimes you get like this sporge winds that would be higher. So 55 is the normal average wind speed. So you cannot survive in a 55 miles in high altitude. So look for these winds. This is a mountain forecast always. Um, and then you can see the freezing levels as well, uh, where the snow is frozen. Um, um, it will tell you like freezing point. Um, right now, I, I picked this uh, some for Baker a few uh, week ago. 4,000 feet is where the freezing levels are. The reason why this is important is uh, depends upon your traction system. What traction system, when you should put on roughly, at what point, where you can camp, what type of equipment that you can carry makes a big difference by looking at this. And then sunrise and sunsets, why are these so important? Um, I think Abhishek made a comment that people start very early. Right, um, so there is reasons why, uh, but also why sunset and sunrise? Uh, why is this such an important thing for mountaineers? Views, of course, you get the best view, sunrise and sunset, okay? Keeping that aside, when you start early in the morning, two o'clock, three o'clock, the reason why people, all mountaineering starts very early is alpine time, they call it, is because the snow is hard your traction, you know when you put a footing, you're not losing efficiency. Uh, it's frozen snow. Once you start getting into the afternoons, like 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock, then the snow has melted. The sun has hit and it becomes slushy ice, slushy snow. You don't want to climb in slushy snow because you will lose 30 to 40% of your efficiency. You want to keep every efficiency going up. So that's the reason why people start very early. The reason why sunrise and sunset is once the sun starts hitting, your snow is start melting. Once the snow, suns, the snow starts melting, you got ice falls, rock falls on your way. This is the most dangerous thing. So rock will continue to fall because sun has warmed up a certain area and the rock is released all the way from the top, coming down at 200 miles per hour and hitting you, right? So that's the reason why a lot of people try to go very early and you probably knowing sunrise, and of course sunset timing is because you would probably prefer to get before. 
sunlight is down at a certain place or a certain spot where you feel more comfortable noise. You do all these gear checks, weather forecasts, and route maps. Um, you check for earlier climb reports. Um, you get all the permits. There are multiple types of permits. A lot of people will just walk up there and say, oh, I'm going to climb. No, they won't allow you. You got a parking permit. You got a hiking permit. You got a camping permit. Uh, sometimes these permits are even lottery, like Whitney is a lottery system. There are some uh, permits here, also lottery systems. You check how, how the conditions are uh, from earlier climbs. Some people who have climbed. So you map the route exactly how you would go as well. This is my map that, uh, um, and then I put in how I want to go and then start climbing in as well. So these are the things that we do to prepare you for one climb um, because you want to be the safest, you know exactly what you're going to do. If things vary significantly, you are walking away from there. You will do it next day. That's okay um, as well. So there is a lot of preparation that goes behind uh, before someone goes in climb. Uh, this is the question that came up. How did I get into mountaineering? Of course, my first thing is beer and pizza. That's the best. So all mountaineers love beer uh, and uh, pizza, of course. Um, I started hiking with, of course, even uh, Gutti, actually. Um, um, I hiked with Gutti. Our biggest thing was just go get a beer and pizza afterwards. Of course, he's not a pizza guy, uh, but beer. Um, so I always enjoyed that. After a hike, small hike, go get some bone off calories and drink some beer and go home and then... Uh, yeah, crash, uh, right? That kind of started it. And uh, I got used to a call a meetup group. Uh, I think meetup app, a lot of people know, right? Uh, this is the best way you can find people. To find. Uh, you start at different levels. There is a lot of new people in there. There are thousands of hikes that are being posted every day. Uh, people go, you just, all you have to do is sign up to that hike. If you think you read about that hike, if you think you have the physical fitness, just go sign up that hike. Um, and you'll meet a lot of new friends. Meetup app is the best hiking app, I would say. Of course, it's meant for other things, but they use that. Um, and uh, the first winter backpacking on a frozen lake, I did, uh, I think this was the picture uh, that I did, um, I have here. Uh, this is a frozen lake. It was great. Uh, I mean, it taught me how to, and I fell in love with snow right away. I fell in love with the views. I'll show some pictures of the views that later on. Um, some of the hikes, I found great partners, uh, uh, Raj, John King, uh, Mike uh, Rahani, he's the, he runs all the winter backpacking for the uh, west side, um, he has a big uh, climbing group, these are my partners, and of course, at my first hike, I went, it took six hours to just for 4,000 feet, all these things kind of challenged me one way, right, and it gave me time to get away, uh, do certain things, another thing. I found good partners, I found meetup apps. It just kept on building one after the other, one after the other. Then it drew my interest, let me go for further higher up, further higher up. And then I started taking courses and other things. The biggest issue, a lot of time, why people don't get into hiking and monitoring is time. Everyone says like, oh, I don't have time. I got kids, I got wife, uh, I can do this. Yes, absolutely, they are very important. But if you take uh, the amount of time, if you do a time tag or time study of your life, you will be spending 30 to 40 hours doing your household chores. Use that. Find a maid, man. I mean, it's much cheaper. Go find a maid, take their 30 hours and go to mountains. That is exactly how I got away from my wife. I mean, um, the reason why I had to do that is, I mean, I spent like literally... Every day doing like, okay, cleaning, dishwasher loading, going to grocery stores, ironing my stuff, laundry. I mean, I mean, by me hearing that, yes, I'm not rich, but I am rich because I have 30 hours of my time that I can do for myself. My wife is happy too because she gets her time by herself and I get my time for myself too. That is one of the most important things. How do you find time is look at your own schedule and see where you can cut out your stuff, right? Uh, and go after those and try to find an alternative. And I found an alternative through maids, uh, which gave me significant amount. I am not here on weekends at home at all. Uh, and wife is okay with it because I help her and I gave her the maid she wanted. Um, and so nothing else she can complain much. So it, it helped me and her as well. Um, so that gave me time as well. And Pacific Northwest, this is the mecca for hiking, right? You get 29,000 Everest conditions on a 10,000 peaks here. 
that's how bad conditions are, or have sometimes very good conditions as well. So you don't have to climb Everest in order to feel what an Everest feels like. You can climb somewhere like Rainier or, or something like that here as well. Um, I took a lot of mountaineering courses. I mean, uh, avalanche rescue courses, wellness first aid courses, mountaineering courses. I took a couple of rock climbing courses. Um, I took ice climbing courses. I mean, this is just a passion kept on building one after the other. And they started these meetup groups, kept on training me, uh, these partners. And I loved nature. I mean, after once I camped on this frozen lake, I always wanted to be there. Uh, and I'll show you some pictures of how different life is once you start getting into these areas as well. So that kind of drove me. Uh, beer and pizza started, and then once I got it into the trainings, then I became a little more professional way of climbing uh, as well. My best hike and why. Um, this is uh, Mount Adams, uh, 12,280 feet, not too high, 13 miles, 6,000 um, feet gain. Uh, we carried a pack of 36 pounds. Uh, the best parts of this hike is um, I camped at a place where I could see Neowise Comet. Um, this is a picture taken by my friend, not me. This is the Milky Way, how it looks when the sky is clear. And you can see all the people who are climbing actually too on this once in the early in the morning um, as well. Um, so there is a different route there. And this is a different route and you can see someone's couple of people already there as well. And this is the uh, west side facing and you can see this is the ridge. Um, this, is, uh, this is the one. In. The reason why I like this one is we were planning to camp somewhere here. Uh, so like, okay, we're just going to camp here. By the time we, we walked so fast that we reached here too early, like 12 o'clock. We, we didn't know what to do till like 12 hours, just sit in the camp, I mean, do nothing. Let's try to go all the way up to the summit and see if we can camp there. So we started going up and we did camp on the summit. And uh, the other thing that uh, I enjoyed about this is, this is a very steep slope. It may not look uh, 30, 40 degrees. Um, you can actually slide down on your butt like I'm using it. You know, just, it's a great glissading. Uh, I put a link here for YouTube for what the glissading means. It just keeps on sliding and sliding. It's a fun like a kid. You can just slide on snow as well. Um, show you some pictures. Uh, this is actually the sunset picture where I put that on the top of the summit or close enough to the summit. Um, this is where mm, the picture I took from my camp. This was the summit. You can see people, small people actually. Um, that's not too far. I mean, I'm going to set a mile and a half and uh, maybe 1500 feet gain still left for us. Uh, we camp here. Um, oh, by the way, a previous one, you can see these stones are meant to block the wind. Um, um, and this is uh, the mountain uh, sunset uh, view, actually. Mountain shadow. Uh, high mountains always cast nice shadows. Uh, and my summit picture, I'll start getting into the pictures now more. Um, so let's, this is my tent. Uh, I think I felt very good with this iPhone 11 picture. So um, this is uh, actually sunset picture as well. Uh, very beautiful summer. This is the reasons why I like going on a hike. When you see this type of beautiful sunset, and I'll show you some more wonderful hikes pictures as well. Why it draws you so much. I mean, you're lonely by yourself. You're thinking on your own thoughts. That drives it. Feed the mind and soul. Talking about topic, I think uh, Ripul Tiagi and uh, Nitin sent me this uh, a few days ago. Uh, um, it is actually like a yoga. Um, if you look at mountaineering, I mean, it's one step after the other, right? I mean, eventually, or eight hours just focusing on nothing but how do you put your next step, um, which is nothing but a medicine, uh, meditation-wise. You go pay a massage parallel, you get the serene views, you get the pristine sounds, you get the best smells, all that you get here for eight hours. That's what the meditation of the mountaineering is. Uh, the breathing style, uh, which is actually because you increase your breathing, you use a diaphragmatic breathing uh, uh, for mountaineers are uh, can have. This is nothing but in yoga, they call it ujjayi, uh, which is kapalabhati as well, which is called pressure breathing. I talked about to reduce altitude sickness. This is nothing but pranayama. I mean, you're breathing like all eight hours this way. Imagine the health. I mean, in, in regularly pranayama is done for 10 minutes or so. That's what they... If you're doing this for eight hours, imagine how good your body could feel like. 
endomorphin chemical rush. This is called the happy hormone. There are other uh, hormones that comes in. You'll get better sleeps. You're clear in mind. It tames your. There is a competitor in you, right? It always sounds like, oh, I should go more. I should do more. But it also tames you like, hey, man, relax, enjoy, right? Uh, I met a friend. He said, like, what's so rush? I mean, you're working like on a, on a Gantt chart. And that was, I won't name the friend, but yeah. He, he told me that, and then once I got into mountaineering, I'm, I'm a lot more relaxed. I'm, I'm in life. I mean, I know what's the best things. It always my ego. Is mountaineering a sadhu? Yeah, probably in some ways it is. It is a sadhu style as well. What keeps me going? Um, accomplishment and inner satisfaction. Clearly, um, this I get every hike. Uh, as I'm very closer to nature, um, that keeps me going every day doing something with the nature, seeing how different they are. Every time it is different route. So multiple routes to the same summit. One summit has probably 50, 60 routes sometimes. You can take different routes to get to the same end point that teaches some things in life. Every season is different. As I told you, this is winter, this is summer. Okay, getting up there is not easy. You have to go all around the lake. In winter, you can just cut across and cross the frozen lake as well. Every year is different. And sometimes uh, the crevasses where it was last year is not at the same place. So that means you can come up with new ways every way, every time. It's out of a rat race. It's my time. I get the best help. I found many friends, good friends, I mean, and to share stories with or they share their life stories with how they became mountaineers as well. It is, a, it's a kind of a cult and it's a, what do you call it? It's a, it's a drug for the weekend for me. Uh, and sometimes, of course, the whole week as well. That's an addiction uh, that you get into and you cannot get away once you get in. I injured my leg a month ago, uh, just outside running. Uh, and the last one month, I am struggling, uh, uh, like it's a drug rehabilitation center. I, mean, I can't be outside. Uh, I can't even run, I can't walk. Um, I'm struggling with that. Um, so that's what yeah, I, uh, that keeps me going. And it is, it's beautiful. Luckily, I'm living in a great place, Pacific Northwest, which gives me these opportunities to do so. Um, just a picture of how three roping up. Um, so, uh, some good pictures you can see. Uh, this is the summit that we were trying to go after. Um, so, we go around, and there are lots of ways, uh, people coming in. Um, just a general knowledge, there are seven summits. I think a lot of people know what seven summits are. Every continent has one. Uh, there is only one disputed one, which is the Mount Elbrus. Um, Russians think that it is part of Europe and they are highest, but uh, Europeans think that it is part of Asian plateau. So it is not part of Asia. Mont Blanc is the highest. So apart from that, everything is, these are the seven top mountains. Uh, it is also an accomplishment and award for mountaineers to go. Uh, and also people do two poles and extra, which is called Grand Slam. Um, so there are lots of people who hike this. Kilimanjaro is probably a lot more easier to do. Denali is probably the worst weather that you can find. Everest, because of the porters fix the ropes, you can, I mean, yes, it is tough. Uh, this is the most tougher one because you actually travel miles and miles in rainforest in order to get there. Um, this is, of course, Antarctica, which is a big, uh, expedition by itself yeah, in order to get there. Um, this total cost of seven summits with porters is probably around 250 to $300,000. Uh, if you continue, if you're in good shape and you're trying to go out. Um, I'll try to speed up. I know uh, uh, these are the 14, 8,000 peaks and the good part is all of them are around India. Roughly. And Parvat K2, this is the other, other thing, a lot of mountaineers try to go after. Uh, um, and so these uh, 14 peaks are very important. Uh, anything above 8,000 feet is tougher for, and these mountains actually are very worse for mountaineers. A few notable mountains. Uh, K2, one of the worst mountain, it killed 30% uh, people die climbing. And it is, in, and this is the pioneer for a mountaineer. Um, if someone climbing at K2 on the north face is considered as the best mountaineer that you can find in the world. Uh, Meru, uh, which is the shark fin. There is a movie. I would suggest to see these movies when you guys get time. It's such a grit they show with these movies how people struggle to get up there. Very done movies. Meru, there is a very personal life story. I have met this guy, Conrad Anchor, as well. 
he lost three friends climbing this three times and he still never gave up and finally climbed this mountain. This is called Shark Fin. Uh, this is actually in India. Um, so now I think because of water distribution in other areas, this area is closed to climbing. Annapurna, which is in Nepal, this is another second worst mountain. 63 people died of 191 climbers to that. Matterhorn, which is a very pretty mountain, uh, Swiss mountains, large Swiss uh, flag on an emblem. So you see this mountain everywhere, Matterhorn flies, or you would see this as a kind of a grand image uh, for perseverance and other things. Some other few, Sierra Grande, this is a, the, probably one of the best movies I have seen on mountaineering, Touching the Void. The guy survives in a glacier for four days and comes out. Mount Blanc, um, I haven't put in the picture, everyone know what Mount Blanc looks like, Mount Washington, which is in New Hampshire. This is the highest winds recorded in the whole world. Um, so I know people, uh, yeah, and the Iger is the North Face, which is the, there is a beautiful movie, Mount Kailash, uh, which is a holy mountain in Nepal uh, and is not allowed to climb. North Face, the brand, I think, is, comes because uh, North Face does not get sun. It is very icy. And this is the most toughest climb of any summit. That's why North Face is a brand, very nicely significant brand in mountaineering. Uh, people in mountaineering, they try to go to North Face after doing all the other things. Um, I'm gonna speed up for time purposes, it's two hours. So this is the biggest mountain in our solar system. It is in Mars. Uh, Everest, Hawaii has the big mountain, but of course it's submerged in a lot of the areas. Other areas where you can get into mountaineering, uh, as well. Um, US has large mountaineers, New Zealand has better, Europe has Alps and Urals, Canada, Rockies and Cascades, Patagonia and South America. These are very nice mountain range here. Asia has uh, these ones too. Himalayas is of course Karakor as well. Um, I'm gonna come back to this questions. Uh, let me just uh, go through coffee room chats and personal experiences wise. Some of the resources I have, I'll send these slides out, anyone who wants it. Buy this book, absolutely. Mountaineering, Freedom of Health. It's always on my desk every time. Um, this is the Bible for mountaineering. It teaches as if you're a basic kid, always. It's a very cheap book and you will get every detail how to be. These are all the guides you can get in mountaineers wise. Um, the posts and other things as well. Um, I'm gonna go through some pictures. So um, notable pictures, I'll quickly, so that I'll give time and ask, let the team ask some questions. Um, some slopes wise, so people ask me to post some pictures. Um, and uh, this is a Black Peak area, some frozen lakes, even in July, this is how the conditions are in the Pacific Northwest. Um, St. Helens, this is a February picture, uh, the climb of this mountain. This was my first uh, mountaineer at the time. Um, and very beautiful pictures. You can see corners, this is the dangers of mountaineering as well. When you get on here, the weight of you can Slim down. Um, my goggles in the highest peak. Mount Shasta, this is in California, uh, which is very barren in summertime um, as well. My first 14,000 feet um, as well. And um, this Mount Shasta, uh, you don't see the peak from here, it's on the other side. Uh, of course, a couple of our friends that went in for that. Um, I think if someone knows about nearing this pose is someone very, uh, very nice guy, changing in Norway. When he reached Mount Summit, someone took a picture of him like that, so I, I tried to imitate him. Um, this is in Camp here, Mount Rainier, uh, close to enough to the summit where we walked away from. Um, so this is uh, one of the climbs. Um, this picture was taken actually in the night. Uh, the moonlight is so beautiful that it, you can see it's pretty much like the sun. Um, this is a very bad picture of mine. Um, unfortunately, I didn't use high resolution or anything. Um, so this is actually, you can see all the stars and other things, which is most pretty nice. And you, this is how bright it could be when you have full moon uh, and nothing else around you. Uh, uh, sorry, the picture I was behind. So, uh, quickly go through some of the sunlight pictures, uh, clouds, pristine conditions. You can see the route that I came in. Um, some of the conditions that we were in, a couple of my hiking buddies, my tent, which I put in, uh, sunset pictures. This is what, what is mountaineering. I mean, you enjoy this every minute once you reach there. These are the types of views you get. 
Um, this is the mountain that I was showing in some of the glacial mountains. This is a moat coming all, all down there. Um, so this, this, I'll show different versions of the same picture. Actually, this is when the winter time I climbed. Um, this is actually in summertime I climbed. The same place. Um, this is actually kind of fall, I would say. And how I'm, I climbed this place four times. This is also sometimes in springtime as well. So the terrain could be completely different, winter versus. So that's why it's not the same. You climb all the time, every time. So, uh, oh, uh, some pictures are not working out well. I'll come back to this uh, for time reasons. So, uh, this is a moonlight, actually. That is a moon because you can see all the stars. This is how nice the reflection of the moon was. Um, some some pictures that I can go through. Mountaineering doesn't need to be always uh, snow. You get all these types of views as well. And you see uh, some of these mountains. Uh, you know, and you stand on Rocky Mountains, you get these as well. So the notable trails, and this is where I kind of practice sometimes rock climbing as well. This is called Frenchman Coal, which is three hours from Seattle. Um, so kind of uh, I'll um, go through certain things previously, questions-wise, people have asked. And then uh, let me start opening up for questions. Um, and then see if we have time, I'll go through some more pictures later. So what, what questions do you guys have for me? Hey, is anyone no. still on? <laughs> <laughs> Hello. Can yeah. you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Uh, so there was a question from, uh, or, a, or a comment uh, from Harish uh, Deshpande. So he says, uh, my resting heart rate is 55 without any mountaineering. Anything to worry about? Oh no! Yeah, it's great. If you have, you can. You have more to go. Then you can get to forties. If you do mountaineering, probably you can get to forties. So the lower the better, right? Uh, I mean, mm, of course, because the less of the heart works, the better. So I reach. I mean, it's great. Some of us, some of you like you, are blessed with such low heart rate. I am not, um, um, unfortunately. Um, so that helps me to reduce my heart rate too. Some people have around fifty fives, which is good. Um, but getting to 50s is very, very good. Um, that helps you. Okay. So the next one is from uh, Prem Raj Pillai. How do you go to Lou in minus 50 degrees? <laughs> you actually go in the tent, man. Um, you carry a separate tea bottle. Um, so which sometimes you and your partner share. Okay. Uh, yeah, these are some things not uh, good about mount hearing, but... Uh, Yes, uh, those are certain things that you have to follow. You carry a separate pee bottle when you actually get out, then you empty the pee bottle, bring the bottle again, use it. And just make sure that you don't mix the bottle with water. Oh, okay. uh, the poop thing is one of the things that I want to kind of, uh, there is always a mountaineering policy, you pack everything up, right? So uh, there are two ways. One, um, actually you buy blue bags. You just go in and like a polythene bag that has some cat litter in it. And then you pack out, you use toilet paper to clean yourself up and then pack everything up. That's how you go to the poop. Or of course, if it's minus 55, you're not gonna sit outside. I mean, taking down a pant itself will freeze your ass off, right? So you actually do it in the tent. I mean, unfortunately, yes. And your partner will be torn the other way when you're doing it. So those are certain things that you have to live with, uh, but it's a must. When you have so much sodium, and you have so much bowel movement walking up and down on the mountain, you would prove very well the next day. Okay, so there's a question from Subhuti about um, Kailash. Um, so is, is Kailash um, tougher than K2 to, to hike? I think you briefly touched upon that to the religious or holy angle, but from a technical perspective, what do you think? So K2 is the toughest uh, mountaineering mountain in the world. Um, and there's nothing to know. I mean, of course, different conditions in different mountains can change that. But overall, K2 is considered as the pioneer for any mountaineering person. Uh, uh, Kailash is, uh, is, of course, technical as well. Um, but it's not allowed to climb. Um, I don't think anyone has climbed it in the last 200 years of that. Um, it's forbidden. It's a government law. Um, I think uh, there were a couple of... Uh, Westerners tried to do snake in and do it, but they died. Um, for whatever reasons, uh, they died in the first year of the hills. So, um, yeah, it's not uh, allowable to climb Kailash for some reason. 
Okay. So I think you talked about this, but if you've got any more points to add to that, what is in mountains, mountain tops that deeply influences your mind and soul? Again, from Subhuti. You see from the top. That's the most important thing, right? So uh, when I reach summit, it's not about an accomplishment that drives me. Uh, this is my personal experience. I mean, everyone feels different. When I look down, um, I, it shows me like what I have gone through in order to get there. Uh, it's not the success that drives me up there. Uh, it's actually what the journey that I have to go through in order to get there. That drives me. Um, all your journey becomes happy ending, right? At the end, when you reach that summit, uh, you take a nice uh, glass of hot coffee or hot cocoa or hot water, whichever it is. Your favorite drink, you sit there, have a couple of cheers with your friends. I mean, um, that's the beauty of it. And you reach there safe. Um, as well, you overcome lots of the obstacles. You you overcome some things that you never planned while walking, and you had so many laughs. You trusted your partners to with you, and you, they trusted with you. Lots of things were happening during this. So all this comes together when you get to the summit, right? That's why a lot of people are very emotional when they get to the summit. Yes, I have done it. It's not because they're proud bragging rights. It's actually humble humbleness that. They surrender themselves to the peak. That's how I feel when I climb to the mountain summit wise. Over to the rest of you for any other questions. Hey, hi, uh, Vishnu Sarish here. I just wanted to check is mountaineering is always a hobby or uh, can it become a, a career option for anyone? Oh, yeah. Personally, for me, I don't think I'm. Uh, it's a career option for me. Um, I mean, yes, uh, as a hobby can turn into a career. Yes, absolutely. A lot of people, mountaineers, there is a significant amount of life. I mean, people enjoy doing this uh, careers wise. They make careers out of mountaineering. Uh, it does start as a hobby. And a lot of times, uh, I am personally, I know I'm for, uh, my age has gone. Uh, it's not an age where I can train myself significantly to go higher and higher or so take more risks. But there are some people who have been training for 10, 15 years in Mount Aaron. I mean, those people do make careers. They take young people, they train young people. It's a kind of giving back as well. Uh, for me, I don't think it is a career at this point um, because I still have so much to learn. I have not been exposed to the rough elements yet much. I can start. I, we can't hear you. Sorry, the volume was very low. Someone speaking, Harish. Is that you? Uh, if no, you don't mind me. typing in the chat, that would be good. It's not me. So, but I have another question. So, uh, so our mountaineers are always required to uh, uh, collect all the trash when I say the trash that you uh, do uh, to reduce pollution, whatever, to avoid any pollution there. Um, that's the gentleman's trend, I'd say. Yes, there are some violators as well, but there is no hard and fast rule um, that you have to. But most of the national parks, uh, they do post signs and warnings about to pack everything, um, to pack back. Um, because the, you want to keep the nature as pristine as possible. We don't want, we want to leave as you saw it. We don't want to show an impact. Uh, like, I mean, for example, the mountaineering, uh, Mount Everest now has become like a commercial uh, uh, adar, right? I mean, uh, leaving trash everywhere, plastic everywhere. That's not the scene that we want to leave for. Um, at least in, there is very good etiquette um, that mountaineers follow, a lot of hikers follow to keep the place very pristine. Um, and uh, of course, there are lots of violators as well. But uh, the true mountaineers, they they follow the good etiquette. Uh, they're trained for to carry their stuff back. So the next one is from uh, Monty. Um, have you ever been rescued, Vishnu, from a crevasse or uh, from a mountain top? And a follow-on one on top of that from uh, Chiki is uh, or share an experience of saving someone. Um, uh, no, personally, I have not been rescued or I have rescued someone uh, as a part of a uh, hiking. 
uh, what we do when we do the training class, we actually put someone in, in the crevasse. So I have, I hung myself in a crevasse so that someone could pull me out, okay? So kind of, kind of, kind of you can consider it as a rescue. Um, but I have done the same thing so that I get, can practice someone pulling out from a crevasse as well. I hope I don't get into that situation, but uh, I have been in a crevasse or pulled someone out from a crevasse as a practice sessions, um, sometimes in good weather, I would say. Okay. So the next one is from uh, Meghna. Which mountains are you planning to hike next? Um, I do have a plan to Mount Elbrus, which is in Russia, I think one of the seven summits. And uh, if time allows, or of course my job allows, Mount Denali, or Mount McKinley, they call it, uh, which is the highest mountain in the U.S. and also one of the toughest mountains in the world, I would say, are my options, uh, Elbrus and Denali. Uh, there are a couple of mountains here I struggle. Every time I go, there are some reasons I get pushed back. Mount Whitney, I went three times to Mount Whitney, and, um, and then I was pushed back because of some reasons. And sometimes fire, sometimes this, sometimes that. There are some few mountains I'll try to do. Um, but um, I'll try, Denali would be my highest achievement of my life if I can do that. Um, my goal is I have five years left. I mean, I know you can still hike after 50 as well. Uh, it's not an age issue or it's, of course, you, you got to be cautious and as well, right? What is the right age where you can do some things or what you can push? If, if your body can still give after 50s or 55s, great. I mean, you can do more. But there is also a point where uh, effort versus the amount of effort you put in, the amount of time you put in, um, is also changes. So I personally believe I got another five years left to do other crazy stuff that I do. Uh, and I want to come for these uh, at least a few, seven summits before uh, the five years, if, if my legs and other things work. Uh, the next one is from Guti. Um, can you take brandy or something alcoholic to keep yourself warm while camping, Vishnu? Yeah, um, actually, alcohol is very bad for altitude sickness, Guti. Uh, you do can take alcohol, it, it generates a short term heat, like in survival mode, yes, yeah, it makes sense. Um, but it also kills your energy too. Um, the body needs also energy to burn it off. It generates heat for sure once it burns, but the body takes energy to burn that alcohol, uh, right? Um, so uh, it's good. It keeps you warm for sure, absolutely. And also for lots of reasons, alcohol is good. Uh, but it, um, it's, uh, it's in your blood the next day. The blood with alcohol is not good for oxygen carrying. Oxygen is very important for you when you're climbing. Uh, the second thing, of course, is I an mean, altitude sickness uh, becomes tougher uh, with alcohol as well. I would love to take a beer. There are a couple of people who take beer. It's kind of water uh, to just celebrate on the summit. Uh, but um, heavy alcohol probably, um, no, not many people do that. <laughs> the one following that is, uh, is, is, is weed. Uh, ask Subhuddi. <laughs> I, I think I, I shared this with Guti. So there was a one person yeah. in my uh, climb. Uh, she came to, I think, 12,000, 12, 13,000. She already had altitude sickness. And she went to bed. She woke up in the middle of the night, started smoking, right, a weed, uh, because she couldn't fall asleep. And so she, oh, she became so delusional wise. Um, and it's very tough for her. She couldn't even, she, she, she walked into the ranger's hut there, started banging on their doors. Um, she never experienced, we, when we were sharing that story with her the next day, she did not even remember. It's not because she never spoke to weed, but because of the altitude and other things that became exaggerated. Some people can handle it very well. Um, weed actually helps from a pain perspective. Um, it also boosts your energy. Um, it seems, uh, of course, because of the hormones or endocrines, they call it, um, but it's not for long term. Um, so there are some positives from it. Of course, ox uh, breathing smoke is not never good, uh, but um, it comes with some positives, but more dangers with it rather than you want your mind to be perfect condition when you, when you want to be 
like 2,000 feet uh, drop next to you. Oh, question Nitin Singh also here, okay? <laughs> no, no, this one was from <laughs> Subodhi again. <laughs> New Year's me, Abhishek, they just started it, right? So I thought I'll just ask. <laughs> is that what my image is? <laughs> <laughs> no, New Year's Eve, man. So that's why January, I asked. Not because January 1st onwards. January 1st onwards, I'll ask these questions. <laughs> okay. okay. Great. Um, so if... Public image. <laughs> oh. Can you hear Ken? Okay, go ahead. Uh, so, Nitin's got to work on his public image. Exactly, you see? <laughs> I can not hear you, Ken. So, great session, Vishnu. If there are no other questions, I think we will um, call it a day. Uh, Vishnu, um, one more question. Sure. Uh, so, since it is physically so exhausting, you know, so how often do you talk with your partners while climbing? Uh, talking with partners, um, pretty much not much, I would say. That's the reason why it's a meditation for you. Because you probably know you have climbed with your partners well enough. You know what they're doing. Okay. Um, you do come to your points. There are rest stops, right? We try to take rest every hour or every an hour and a half. Um, we still maintain, uh, based upon the circumstances of the crevasses, or we maintain certain distances. But literally sitting down, or unless you get to the camp, that's when you talk more about the routes, other things. When you're climbing up, you're already separated by the rope distance. Um, so it's very tough unless uh, you see him something doing wrong, or you want him to wait for you, or you want to take a break quickly, or whatever the reasons that kind of drives it. Uh, it's pretty much solo, I would say. Um, less talk with your partners, but trust with your partners more because you know what they're going to do um, next. You should be anticipating seeing them what they're doing. Correct. Thanks. Thank you, Vishnu. Um, so, uh, yeah, um, please, um, can you all uh, post on the main group and, you know, spread the positivity and, you know, um, make the next sessions more successful? Thank you, guys. It's been a pleasure sharing mine. And anytime anyone wants to go somewhere, um, I think someone is interested to do Kilimanjaro. That is something that I'm interested to. So we can plan for that. Uh, absolutely. That's uh, 14 days um, off your schedule if you want to do it. End of fix. Thanks, Vishnu. Wonderful session. Yeah. You guys are absolutely. welcome. Thank you. Crack Thank you, Vishnu. Excellent. Thank you, Vishnu. Thanks, guys. Thank you, Vishnu. Great session. Thanks a lot. I'm sorry, a lot of the general knowledge stuff there more. I appreciate your feedback and time. Yeah, anything. Yeah, let me know if you have any questions among Mary. More happy. To